will cease due to a lack of uh, a loss of quorum. So we'll uh, we'll get as much in as we can between now and uh, and then, and we'll get going. So uh, first item then is approval of. Um, uh, sorry, let me make sure I'm looking at the right approval of the minutes of April third. So moved. Thank you. Second. Thanks. All those in favor? All right. Thank you. And we're Not seeing any. Thank you. Okay, and then we'll move right into a um, update on uh, progress on our population growth initiatives, and uh, we'll turn that to David Gobblestein. Okay, good morning, good morning. everyone. Uh, so we're going to breeze through this. I have two presenters with me today, uh, Sarah Ranson, Joel Mercer from IT, who are going to be presenting here, uh, Teresa Phillips from Opportunity to Serve and we have Robert Shore from our own HR department. So, uh, so we're happy to say that uh, so far with the population growth framework, we have one action item complete. Two of our actions are ahead of schedule. So we just went on the recruitment mission to Toronto. We'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, our OMB Connects program is uh, doing really well, which Trace will talk about here shortly. One of our projects has delayed um, the exploratory visit process. We've been having meetings with um, Moncton and Frederick from the province. And the reason it's delayed uh, is because now all three Tri-Cities and the province want to get together to put a plan in place for the whole southern part of the province. So rather than every municipality go their own way, we're trying to collaborate. So it'll push it back a little bit. But in the meantime, we are still meeting with investors, and there is a contingency plan in place for when uh, exploratory visitors do come into town. Uh, 14 of the 30 projects are currently in progress. And Leah's going to talk about one of those today, uh, the cultural sensitivity training. And 12 projects are still yet to start. So I'll talk a little bit very briefly about our recruitment mission to Toronto. Uh, it's your way. This is a, a priority for you. Um, you wrote it right in the framework that you want us to go somewhere this year and start recruiting people. So that's what we did. Uh, initially, the mission to Toronto was primarily about a recruitment fair for newcomers. But then as we started working with Opportunities to Brunswick and the province and the cities of Moncton and Fredericton, we thought, let's work together. We could do an investment attraction opportunity as well, and that's when the mayors started getting involved. And so as you are well aware, the, the three mayors presented a very cohesive message uh, at the Economic Club of Canada. It was very well received. Uh, we got quite a few uh, positive comments from those in attendance. Some people said to me it was the most positive economic club luncheon they'd ever been to. Um, and so we're, we're continuing to work leads there and it was just a chance for us to start selling New Brunswick to large business. Um, in terms of the job fair, so we actually had a team, uh, there was five of us from the city who went there. Sorry. You haven't seen this one? No. Oh, yeah, it's Teresa pointing. Um, so very well received. I'm going to show you some of the stats which you might have seen in your packet here. Um, there was almost 2,000 attendees who visited this job fair, and we brought with us four local employees. We'd invited five. One was unable to attend just at the last moment, but we had over 300 job openings with us in tow when we were there. Uh, 38 job seekers to date have been shortlisted, and many have been invited to St. John or have been flown in already for interviews. So we're still waiting on further metrics to see actually how many jobs uh, this turns into. We've received over 140 resumes from folks that were at the job fair who would move here in a heartbeat if we could connect them with the job. So our team is currently now trying to play matchmaker with those people. Um, just to put into perspective how many people were there, there was as many newcomers in one day in that fair as we will get moving here in five years. So the level of access that we had was unprecedented for us. And so that was a consistent message that we heard from newcomers. Some of them had been in Canada literally for three days. They literally got off the plane and the only reason they were in Toronto was because it was the only place they heard about. And I guess to put it into perspective, maybe it's a dangerous question to ask, but how many of you would know more than, say, two or three major cities in India? And I would suspect that most of us aren't really well attuned with the geography of India. We might know about Mumbai or New Delhi, but that might be it. It's the same thing for newcomers when they come to Canada. They've heard of Toronto, they've heard of Vancouver, maybe Montreal. They certainly have not heard of even mid-sized cities, and they definitely have not heard of even the province of New Brunswick. We did a, a presentation to about 300 newcomers, and not a single hand went up when we asked them if they knew where New Brunswick was. So we have to get the message out to these folks, but they're very eager to move. They've already moved to Canada from uh, upwards of 10,000 kilometers away. It's just another short jump to move to New Brunswick. Because the consistent message that we heard was uh, Toronto was not what they expected when they came to Canada. They didn't want those kind of crowds. They didn't want 
uh, the, the cost of living that they were faced there. They wanted safer neighborhoods. Um, they wanted affordable housing. So the things that we have to offer here. So um, we're now getting quite a few requests from local employers who want to go on the next mission. So the Tri Cities are. We're looking at whether that should be October of this year or whether it's in the next year. We'll probably want some feedback uh, from the growth committee about how often you want us to go, at least from the framework's perspective. The mandate was once this year and once next year. Um, and we'll get further updates as we go along. So now I'd like to invite Sarah Manson, manager with IT, to give a presentation on an update to the website. Your Worship. Surely we hear quarter to one. I just called her. So we'll have a quorum now. She just said, she, I just told her she had to come, so she said to be here a quarter to one. Okay, she'll sit out in the kitchen. <laughs> well, no, you don't have to. She's probably with the flu. It's coming in. Uh, no, no, she hasn't got the flu. She has okay. a mental problem. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, um, basically, we have from this committee, um, the IT department kind of uh, took on um, a mission to put a fresher look on our, on our website, so we have uh, a landing page. Um, and um, the landing page was to kind of help direct traffic and also when we, when we went to the, um, the recruitment mission that they would have a quick, quick um, place just to go, go here and this is where you can find all about uh, what we have to offer in, in St. John. So um, the, uh, the idea of the landing page is if someone wants to visit here, they have one button to click and it takes us into the website. Um, if they want to invest here, they click that and then, they, then they're linked to places like their present John. All the, all the agencies in St. John that we're, we're all, are all working towards the growth. So um, I just kind of, as background to work that went into it, we had Nancy Moore uh, got the design started and she uh, worked on design and complete pictures. Um, the, um, um, the project was uh, coordinated with the release of the Develop St. John website. So that link was also linked into our landing site. And, um, and then also um, <coughs> Life on Your Terms website was updated as well, and then also the direct traffic from the city website to, to that. Um, so the landing page um, helps uh, triage uh, people that are looking for, even um, people in the city, if they say, I want to start a business, <coughs> it's really easy to find. So um, do you have another slide for me? Okay. Um, so just before I get into the revamp, I do have some information for you that um, we are getting uh, hits on the website. Um, our top hit is uh, our current transit information, and then our home page and our landing page. And we're not surprised that the landing page is a little bit lower still than the home page, because a lot of people have bookmarks, and also we have to uh, do some updates with Google, so that's uh, something we'll take away. Um, and then uh, we're getting hits from St. John, Montreal, Halifax, Chris Pancis, and Fredericton. That seems to be where the interest is coming from. Um, and uh, we are going to do a, uh, a new website in the next uh, year or so. Nancy Moore is going to head that up. And um, our current page is kind of based on value for service for people who live here. And I think the, uh, the new one is going to be more user-friendly, a welcoming design, um, a lot of graphics, that kind of thing. So I also just wanted to um, recognize Lisa and Dave, who um, helped us with our, our landing page and gave us some input as well as Joel, who came with me today, who uh, pulled it all together and actually got it done in time for the recruitment commissions. Okay? Okay. All right. So and now, uh, Teresa Phillips will give a quick update on the OMB Connects program. Great. Good morning. So as New Brunswick continues to innovate, so does um, Opportunities New Brunswick. And three months ago, we launched uh, a connector program, which is called the OMB Connects uh, program. So it's a simple, um, efficient networking process that matches um, civil servants, professionals, and community leaders as connectors to job-ready newcomers uh, and local and international post-secondary graduates as connectees. Okay. Um, so it helps them build that professional network and also helps them get connected with local labor market information. So the goal of the OMB Connects program is to retain our talent here in New Brunswick. So my role at OMB is looking after the Southwest region. Um, moving forward this, this particular year, we had set a goal of getting uh, 50 connectors in the St. John Southwest region. Um, and as of Friday, last week, we actually surpassed it. So we actually have 52 connectors 
um, mainly in the St. John region. And as of connectees, we have 19. So we would like to have more connectees, which would be newcomers to St. John, local and international students. Um, so with your help, I'm hoping that I can leave some packages. <laughs> and I would love for you all to become a connector. Um, and uh, the way that it works is we, uh, if you are a connector, you will be matched with a connectee that is in our system. Um, the way that I like to say it so everybody kind of has a good understanding is that it works like eHarmony. So you're in our system as a connector and we have connectees and you get to be a match depending on what your professional background is or your education or your volunteer experience or um, you see how it works with the match. We then get a connect and then you will meet with that connectee for 30 minutes out of the next year. That's all that we're asking. So 30 minutes of your time. When you meet with the connectee, you will then introduce them to three people. So it works kind of like a pyramid effect. So you will then give them three people that then they will be able to go out and start networking with. Networking with. Um, what we've been finding is that there's great value in a professional network. Um, and studies show that up to 60% of the jobs um, that you can get in this area is through professional networking um, versus the other traditional ways of applying online. Um, so we've already been um, connecting people and it's been working so far really great. Um, and I will leave packages here. So if you do, uh, if you are right on the streets, I mean we're already networking already so um, this is just a more formalized process uh, what we're looking for is more people in engineering uh, because we have what the professional background is in our connectees and we're seeing a gap that we have uh, some that are uh, we're not getting enough connectors in the healthcare system um, engineering so we know where to focus our efforts um, in, the, in this area. So I will definitely leave the packages here if you would love to become a connector. We have a connector toolkit. It's all done for you. Easy peasy. I meet with you just for five minutes to go through the process and what is the expectations. I can't believe that you got anybody who wants to talk to a counselor. <laughs> <laughs> we have our here. That's great. He's the, and David, you were a connector too. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll um, sign, sign you up. Yeah, it's e very easy. You go on our website. It's ombconnects.ca, um, and I'll leave the postcards here for you and some information packages. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's you just go on and you become a connector. And uh, and if you know anyone that is a local grad again or an international student or a newcomer, you can get them to go on our website to become mm -hmm. a connectee. It's very simple. Thank you, Teresa. Okay, and now Leah Robichaud from our city's HR department will talk about cultural competency training. Yeah, so um, action item 18 is targeted at enhancing the newcomer experience in St. John, and so the first step for that really is to provide cultural competency training to our staff at the city, to our frontline staff, <coughs> to uh, build on the, the awareness and the knowledge and the skills of our, our existing staff because um, without that it's it's really difficult to to look at the services that we offer to newcomers from a newcomer lens without this this base of training so um, our measurement is to have 95 percent of the selected staff which would be our, our frontline staff and managers trained by next August so we do have a little more than a year to to roll this out and and the first group that we that we are looking at would be actually to have our senior leadership and also members from from this committee to participate in the training um, because it's really essential that um, that our managers understand the training that we'll be rolling out to to all members of our staff and so often if, if you haven't heard of cultural competency training and what what does that mean there's really three key components to it, and the first is around the awareness piece. So just being aware of our own culture and our own um, 
the way that our culture kind of shapes how people think and behave, the knowledge of the history and experiences that, that those may have that are coming to our community, and then, again, giving some skills on how to have those conversations, um, why somebody may be reacting in, in a certain way. So uh, that is really the goal of, of this training. And the program itself was developed by the, uh, the NB Multicultural Association. So they've, they've developed the program, however, they don't deliver it themselves, but they have trained three partners in our area. They've trained partners across the province. There are three, three groups in the St. John area, that being CRUDE, the St. John Multicultural Newcomer Resource Centre, and the Y Newcomers uh, Centre. So we will be working with uh, probably all three of those groups to help roll out this, this training to our staff. Um, this benefit to the city, it's really, it's crucial again that our, our frontline employees and managers be culturally, culturally aware <laughs> and learn how to work with people from multiple and diverse backgrounds. Um, again, not only to help build our population within the city, but also just looking at it from a, a staffing perspective within our own organization. So obviously we, we aren't the first to, to, to go down this road of offering this training. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, a, a number of organizations across, across the province have, have already rolled this out. Uh, to all of their staff um, and, acro and across the country. So David has some, uh, some stats here around Starbucks uh, shut down 8,000 U.S. outlets um, related to this bias training. Uh, Nike plans to fix their company culture by rolling this out to all of their staff. The province has rolled this out to all of their, all of their employees. So it's really just uh, the next step for us to, to help build on, on these particular skills for our staff. So we will be doing half day sessions for the majority of our staff. It has been identified there may be some individuals, particularly those um, that, that may have to actually go into people's homes, for instance, that may need uh, a full day of training, but the majority of our staff will be having half day sessions. And in speaking with the partners, they do recommend that the sessions be fairly small groups, so no more than 20 people, and ideally groups of people that work together on a daily basis. Uh, the rationale being that when you're in, in a smaller environment like that, you're more likely to ask those kind of more uncomfortable questions, talk about maybe a different scenario that you've been in in the past, and be able to really, uh, really build on that and, and get some feedback from the trainer on how best to to approach those situations. Sure. I got a question. Uh, this is probably not politically correct, but I don't care. You're training them, right? Or training our staff, our staff. or whoever, whatever, right? To reflect their values, right? So we understand their values of when they come into the country. Is that what we're trying to get at? Or are we trying to, to make them assimilate into the way the Western culture is? That's what I'm trying to understand. Are we training our staff so to be sensitive to their values? Because when they come here, it's like me going into their country, and I've been to the Muslim countries, right, whatever, overseas, right? I should adapt to their way. Is this, this is my getting a drift here, or are we trying to teach them this how it is in this question, or adapt to their ways? I guess I would say that it's, it's not necessarily about adapting, it's, as I mentioned, it's first about having that awareness of what some of our own cultural biases may be. And one, one example that, I, that I, I liked was the example of uh, somebody being pulled over by a police officer and getting out of the vehicle, which would be common practice in some countries. Here that's seen as an escalation. So it's, it's, it's building that awareness for our staff so that if somebody reacts in a certain way, that you know, it may not be for the reasons that we would automatically assume. Sorry, I didn't know if you wanted. To. No, yeah. So I, I, I think, um, I think the answer is that this training is focused on helping the participants in the training understand um, cultures and differences in cultures. I just had a little snippet the other night at uh, 
uh, newcomer why newcomers event where they gave us just a 10 minute snippet and it's sort of very very fascinating and as you, as you said the example was used as well with the relationship with police where very very common here to have for the most part a very trusting relationship with police where in other countries you know it's it's uh, it's not exactly the same so understanding would be the word that I would underline in in this first stage but that's, that's what I'm trying to get at we're changing we're, we're directing our staff Right? Shouldn't the person that, if I go over to another place, I don't care where it is, if it's in your house, you want my shoes off, I take my shoes off. We're training our staff to be sensitive to their values. Shouldn't it be easier for them if we told them the policeman might ask you to get out of the car? That's normal here? Wouldn't that be the easier way? So, it's, it's not either or. It's both ends. So, there is that cultural awareness training that newcomers get when they come to Canada. And our, our settlement associations actually put on that training. Um, they'll talk about money, they'll talk about climate, they'll talk about, you know, greetings, things that we just take for granted, we don't think about. Um, but to Leah's point, sometimes the, the common experience that a newcomer will have in another country is radically different than here. So, you know, if you're a, if you're a firefighter or an inspector going into the house that a Muslim woman <coughs> is, it might be inappropriate for you to touch her, because that would be viewed as offensive. Or if you're in a, if you're t speaking with folks from Southeast Asia, some of them sometimes they can take uh, offense if you're not handing them something with two hands as opposed to one hand. So this isn't about necessarily saying, well, we're just going to change ourselves. It's about both sides coming to an understanding of any cultural biases that we have and trying to work just to be aware of those so that things don't get escalated as, as just one example among many. So, but one of the, the stats that uh, we put in earlier, you can see this in your packet. When they surveyed 7,900 companies, a 1% increase in the diversity uh, of just their staff uh, equivalents to a 2.4% increase in revenue. Uh, probably won't be comparable <coughs> to a municipality, but there's often tensions that happen when cultures interact. And sometimes that leads to really, really great outcomes, especially if there's understanding. So that's part of what we're trying to do with this, is just get people to understand that there's different cultures. There's over, uh, aside from English and French, there's four other language groups now in the city but there's over a thousand speakers who speak an, another language. So just become being aware from a municipal perspective that we are the ambassadors for the city and the first, and the encounters that our residents have with our staff reflects their opinion on the city. So we want to make sure that it's a really welcoming uh, atmosphere. Because they've already moved here from another country, it's just as easy for them to get up and go somewhere else. So. Councilor McKenzie? Yeah, I think it's a really good idea. I'm just wondering if we're uh, rolling out the same hours and same program to our office staff as we are to our frontline workers that are are dealing with people on a daily basis. It seems to me that there might be two different levels of, of requirements there. You know, uh, uh, for example, uh, police officers uh, may need a day long course, you know, because they're dealing with so many different scenarios. Whereas somebody in the permits might only see a person once a week or something, you know. Absolutely, and, and so the, the aim will be, again, to work with the partners to really customize training for the particular work groups. So, for instance, with the firefighters, the firefighters will be training together, and the, the group that will be training them will develop a course targeted for their particular scenarios that they may, that they may encounter. So the majority would be half-day training, but it would be targeted training for their particular work environment. And so yes, absolutely, for, for those individuals, especially those that are going into people's homes that are interacting more than just over the phone, the, the training will certainly be different than, than those that may just be uh, on the phone interacting with someone, for instance. And my second question is, is the province doing this in our schools and hospitals a sort of ongoing training for those employees? So from my understanding and talking uh, with the province, they're rolling this out division by division. So I, I haven't gotten into specifics of which divisions are doing it, but they've made this a priority, uh, where they're now rolling this up to all their staff, and both all the way from frontline all the way up to senior leadership. So, okay. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lowe. Yeah, just getting back to the frontline people, right? Like the police department have policies. They pull a car over, they now park sideways behind them, right? Like in Maine, and and there's countries that never report. To police, they don't trust police, right? They somebody steals their car, they go buy another one. They don't bother reporting it's stolen. I mean, that has happened here in St. John not long ago, right? So, if, if there's policies that the police have laid out, 
by the police department, you're going to try, I mean, which to me, it's a norm, but to them, definitely not, right? So you're going to try to change policies that the police already have in effect? This stage is really just about delivering the training. There is an action item that is looking at all of our city services from a newcomer lens. And so, again, that, that may come into that piece, which is a bit of a bigger, a bigger process. But this particular piece is really just about delivering the training to our frontline staff. Simeon, I, I think it's great what you're doing, but I agree with Blake. There's two sides of this story. It's for us to tell them what we do in Canada, what we do in New Brunswick, what we do in St. John, you know, and, and, and it's an ad to adopt both ways. I mean, it, a policeman pulls you over, he's pulling you over for a reason, like any man, but it, it's, he, it, the thing is he gets out and he's friendly, he doesn't have a gun to your head or something like that. I mean, over there it's a whole different scenario, but I think it's a two-way street. I think that they, they should be shown or whatever you want to say told or displayed how we as Canadians, New Brunswick or St. Johners act, not just the other way around. I think it's two ways. And, and I, you know, of, of my involvement over the years through the cabs with these people, I, I, I understand. But it's a two-way street. It, it's, they have to be shown or explained to how we adapt to situations in this country, Canada, New Brunswick, and different what happens in and you know Iraq, Afghanistan, where these people are coming from. I mean, there's so many, there's so many different countries that they are coming from, and you know you prove that by going to Toronto. I think it's a two-way street, and if it ain't a two-way street, I can't see how it's going to work. Yeah. My opinion. So just a couple of comments. So so first off, um, um, the community is becoming more diverse, um, and and the communities across New Brunswick have to become more diverse. You know, so David Campbell and and Alex LeBlanc, who will be torn through here uh, this in a couple of weeks in St. John, they're using numbers somewhere in the range of 125,000 to 150,000 immigrants needed over the next um, 15 to 20 years, and that's just to sustain our economy. So we are a land of immigrants. Um, um, uh, every one of us, likely in this room, has a connection back to an immigrant. So. Uh, um, so we need a lot more immigration in the future. It means that the community is going to need to be um, understanding, understanding, welcoming, understanding of probably much more diverse um, <coughs> backgrounds and cultures than we've ever been before. Um, on the on the points made by by the two councillors, I, I think that's already happening. You'll go to the YMCA after this meeting, and the upstairs classrooms are full, and uh, that training includes. Um, uh, the topics you've discussed. It includes, uh, you know, language training, all, all kinds of training to say, look, here's, here's where you live and here are what some of the norms are. I just want to make sure, though, that we don't send a message that, you know, I don't know, I don't want to send a message today, I don't think that's what you're saying, of, a, of assimilation is, you know, like you, here's the machine, we run everyone through and they, they become, you know, St. Johners and here's how you have to behave. I think that going forward, um, we are going to have a much more diverse, culturally diverse um, community, and it has to be accepting, and, and uh, that's going to mean that there's going to be, and as, as David meant, I mean, we have a far more diverse culture now, but I think the training that you mentioned is happening, Prude's doing it, the Multicultural Newcomers Resource Center is doing it, the YMCA is doing it, to say, look, here's, here's what those norms look like in St. John, but it doesn't mean you have to abandon them, you weren't saying that, but abandon your own culture and your own beliefs as well. So, so I think this is a step. This is a step to say, um, I, I, I learned a lot in 10 minutes the other night at, um, at, the, at the event with the YMCA. So this is giving our staff an opportunity just to understand first. Um, and, uh, and then if there's opportunities out of that to, to spur other training events and, and uh, make sure that the prudes and the newcomers connections and these groups have the resources they need to or perhaps that turns into to training where we come in and we do training in reverse to as the counselors say help help folks understand what uh, what some of those norms are in St. John so just on that last note there I, as an example for Jerry like Jocelyn McLean's a community police officer she was anyway she had to explain to a, a newcomer family that it's not the norm for young children to be running around, running across the street without looking and everything. But where they came from, that was, you know, they could go in and have a, a nap and the kids would be outside all day. So she had, she had to take some time 
and teach that family that you, one of your kids is going to get hit. You're doing that, and so that was just a simple thing. But it, it, you know, okay. Be sad. okay. Thank you. Let's keep going here. Is that the end of it? Okay. Questions for any okay. of the topics? <coughs> okay. Any questions on on the first base or the second base? Okay. I have a couple of comments then real quick, I guess, just to continue to, um, um, you know, again, I sort of continue to break this down in the short term, medium, long. Short term is, um, I think there, there continues to be tremendous opportunity, David, in um, other cities for interprovincial migration. There's an international migration, it's just more immigration, rather, it's just a bit more complicated. We're going to continue to work both of those channels. Um, I guess it's just more for you to think about and, and the city manager as well. How are we going to continue to measure our progress? Do we have the, you know, the urgency? Or are we feeling the urgency? Um, I think it's critically important. I mean, we're, we're, we're two years <laughs> in since the last census data came out. And uh, it, this is probably one of the most critical areas that we're focused on. Um, and then lastly, my comment is, I guess, around just duplication. I, 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 you know, there continues to be, in my opinion, a tremendous amount of duplication. So, so, um, um, uh, you know, groups, agencies, you know, uh, immigration summits, and it almost seems like every second week there's a new group doing a new immigration summit. And somehow I think we have to, you know, work back through our connections with the province to say, folks, come on, let's continue to, to align, please. Um, and, and get that overarching strategy that, that folks can you know can can work. So, so I guess in plain English, I'm, I, we need to keep beating away any barriers uh, that are going to keep us from achieving success. And then the last one would be, I still believe there's gaps between um, the jobs that we have that we're trying to fill, and I, and and the folks looking for jobs. I, I don't have the I can't put my finger on it. But I, it's like two ships passing in the night, and somehow we have to. I don't, uh, you know, I don't know if it's an assembly of all the information in one spot. I, I don't know what it is, but um, it, it shouldn't. If we need as much talent as we we need in New Brunswick, St. John, we shouldn't have to rely on 70% of the time somebody knowing somebody who knows somebody who can get us a job interview. We, we need to work on that piece. Because um, I, I and I have an example from this weekend uh, that that we had to take some action on, right? But uh, so urgency, removal of barriers, and and uh, and um, um, you know, let's keep the pedal to the metal, as they say. Do you have a comment on that? It's just a real quick comment. I think uh, you know you can you can sense here. I think from the, the broad range of activities, this is a other corporate priority for the city and it's touching all parts of the organization. So things like cultural uh, sensitivity training, you know, that's an example of the city leading by example, taking a best practice, ensuring that we are creating a welcoming environment for newcomers. We're, we're in competition yeah. for people that are coming. We need to, uh, to up our game. Uh, we need to be prepared and welcoming and uh, not only attracting but retaining newcomers. So I, I think this is a, a really important step, but also just want to demonstrate that this is touching all parts of the organization. This isn't something that's sitting in David's office as a priority. This is a, this is a corporate priority. It's going to have a very broad work plan with many different elements. It's, it's going to touch everyone. Is this, just, going to be, is this going to be delivered to the executive directors of our community centers, even though they're not technically an employee? Well, we're starting as our own priority within our own control, obviously the city departments, and uh, we need to, to start talking to the agencies, boards, and commissions, and then you know, we can broaden the audience point beyond that. This isn't something that we've invented, cultural sensitivity yeah. is, is a practice that's done everywhere. We want to control what we can control. Yeah, and I think, I don't have the flyer in front of me, but I believe, uh, so for example, the YMCA, um, Newcomers Connection is delivering this at the um, uh, their program at the um, uh, library in the next week or two. So, so certainly we could get a message out to to those groups, John. You know, to say, hey, you know, this training it's happening. I think quite frequently, and it's at the it's at the library in the next two weeks, for example. And they're very good at it. Yeah. Yeah. Already. But you know, like I've been around for five years, and I've never seen 
this in depth of anything before, going back to what Jeff's talking about. But going back to you, <coughs> can you you say there was 38 people shortlisted, right? Can you give us one example without a name of somebody that was interviewed and ended up at a job instead of just saying there was this and that and without showing, without telling us particularly what happened to one of those 38 people that was shortlisted? Do you follow, do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, I know. What I, saying. I, you know, to say that stuff, it's, you know, motherhood or fairy tales and all that jazz. Tell us of one without mentioning name. You don't even have to tell us where they went. But I mean, you know, I, I think all this stuff's great. Like, you know what I mean? Because we never did it before. We talked about it, but we never did it. But I would like to see you tell us of a person, a human being that was interviewed and it's not working here, that came through what you people did in Toronto. So the stats that we've just presented to you are what we just received last week from the province, because the province has been in touch with their employers. That one of the challenges, again, the mayor talked about duplication. We did a quick head count last week. There's over 30 different agencies just in the city limits that are talking to employers and all about the same topics. So employers can get frustrated when they have this, this revolving door of people coming in and asking them questions. So um, we've left the province to ask those specific questions. Right now we know that 38 were shortlisted. We know that quite a few have actually flown into the city for interviews. Some have done remote interviews. I don't, we don't have numbers right now of actually how many job offers have been on the table, but I would assume we'll bring that to you at the yeah. next growth committee meeting. Do, do you understand where I'm coming from? Like, you can say things, but show me things. Don't, don't tell me things that are that are happening that you can't put something onto. You know, and, and I, I respect it, but I don't mean I'm not trying to knock you. But for me to explain it to people, I, I want to know that John Doe, I don't care what his name is, came out of the meeting in Toronto, came here, flew here, came here by bike or car or truck or something, yeah. and it's now working in this area, and it was through all you people that he ended up here, then he learned the training that these people have said, right? But, you know, to say that the province has got this and you got that and all that jazz, that, you know, that means very little to me. Yeah. I like to have facts. So, so a couple things, Councillor. One is um, that, that um, so we we're gonna, we have a series of measurements in place. And um, I think what, what David's saying is going to follow up. You know, I've, I've had a couple of those conversations as well with employers, but you're, you know, you're sort of having them in, in, you're having them in passing. So I think that having those success stories to say, you know, we, we planned, we went, uh, a number of people came in, and the next step would be to say there were five jobs secured. That's, that's, a, great, that's a great point. Just wanted to go back very quickly, and one of the things as well on our, 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 our growth strategy um, uh, is again a, a year ago uh, we didn't have one number one <laughs> number two we didn't have someone working on population growth on a daily basis so those are two those are two, two key points for us to remember and, and secondly to build on what the city manager said this is also a document that has pulled those major organizations together so of the 45 actions you know Prude has some the YMCA newcomers connection has some you know, the various uh, multicultural newcomer resource center has some. So it's a, I called it before, it's a beautiful collaboration. Is it perfect? No, it's good it, because it's difficult work. We're competing, as, as Jeff already said, you know, across the whole region, across the whole country. But, but a year ago, we had nothing. We had a desire to grow. Now we actually have some actions in place. But I think the point that Councillor Lowe has made around putting some tangible measurement in place, I think is, is critical. Okay, thank you. Okay, so just a receive and file then on that, please. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, okay, thanks. Thank you, everybody. So the next, um, the next presentation on development practices, just to set the table for this, folks. Uh, so we're going to walk through the process, and, and uh, it really is a teaching opportunity for, for all of us as growth members to fully understand the process, um, the processes that we use, and. Um, and we're certainly aware of some other meetings that have taken place around uh, feedback that we've received and so on. But I guess my ask of you is well, let's, let's walk through these processes, understand them, and ask questions around the process today. And uh, see if we can get through as much material as possible. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jack. Okay. 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 Oh, sorry. Okay, thanks. Hey. All right. So, um, so certainly... Um, 
the reason why we're here today is that the topics related to the city's uh, engineering construction uh, practices and process have been ongoing, certainly at the council table, and, and our hope is to take the, the time and space today to to walk you through from some of the practice leads in, in both of those areas uh, to give you some context in terms of the, the key drivers uh, for those requirements, um, what those processes involve, and also to talk about areas of process improvement that are <coughs> being worked on. And um, the presentations uh, will be delivered by the two, I guess the three service areas um, are really responsible for administering uh, many of these requirements. So growth and community development would administer um, infrastructure uh, development uh, processes and Holly Young, our manager of infrastructure development is going to kick things off. Um, Mike, are you are you leading the, the second presentation? So that uh, well, Brian, Brian will be here a little later to, to run through um, some of the, the construction management practices and really the intent is um, to give you a bit of a presentation and to leave lots of time for questions. So we've left certainly built in into the uh, agenda lots of time for that. So with that, I'll hand it over to Holly. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity to this morning to speak with you today on the Infrastructure Development Service Area from Growth and Community Development. Again, my name is Holly Young, and I'm the manager of Infrastructure Development. Here with me today from our team is Nick Landry, right there, a professional engineer with our group, who joined our team about six months ago. Uh, prior to the city's reorganization in 2014, planning, building inspection, and infrastructure development were divided by three separate service counters, physically located in two different buildings. As part of the one-stop development shop, the, these three separate departments were merged into one department, relocated into one building, and integrated into one frontline customer service counter located in City Hall on the 10th floor. Key to the development of the one-stop development shop, Council provided an opportunity for staff to review the services provided for the public, modernize our out-of-date development bylaws, revise and improve processes through more efficient and streamlined delivery. In addition, the one-stop development shop established service standards that could be communicated to our customers with reasonable and fair expectations on submission standards and turnaround timelines, all while, while focusing on a sustainable community and protecting developer investments. So infrastructure development, who specifically are we? We're a very small team comprised of five team members. A senior engineer and a junior engineer, three engineering technologists, two of which are dedicated field resources, and one customer service engineering technical specialist. We are the main point of contact within the organization for developers trying to navigate their way through infrastructure inquiries and approvals that include water, wastewater, stormwater, and traffic related matters. We liaise and communicate for development on behalf of St. John Water and Transportation Environment on all infrastructure development related matters. No, no longer do applicants have to visit multiple counters for additional information or permits. This is all streamlined by us through the one-stop development shop. Yep. The work for which infrastructure development provides guidance and approvals is necessary in order to sustain existing municipal infrastructure, enable growth, and enable the city to invest in infrastructure upgrades. Unlike a building that is tall and prominent above the ground, infrastructure, with the exception of asphalt and sidewalks, is typically buried water and sewer systems. As this slide indicates, the street right away has an entire piping system with various other utilities also sharing this corridor. The other utilities would include such things as gas, cable, and the telephone <coughs> utilities. As part of the infrastructure development process, the review includes impacts on the existing street, connections into the existing piped infrastructure, future corridor needs, and availability for site-specific servicing. In many instances, the city will own the infrastructure pipes being proposed. Therefore, the investment must be sustainable and protected, which includes proper design and installation. The city has approximately 1.5 billion in infrastructure assets. These assets must be protected and considered throughout the entire development approval process. 
Our main goal for the community is to provide support and sustainable development. Infrastructure de Development is responsible for reviewing and approving the infrastructure component of all building permits and planning approvals, permitting and inspecting all water and sewage and street road cut excavations, approving and inspecting all new utility installations including Bell, Rogers and natural gas installations, and physically locating and marking in the field over 3,200 requests per year for water and sewer pipe locations as a result of the call before you dig utility service. Infrastructure development provides development support through collaboration with developers, contractors, consultants, utilities, and the citizens. We provide this through reasonable and fair requirements, only asking what is required for specific projects. We do not over ask for information or duplicate information requests. We provide technical support staff, both in the field and in the office, for the approvals, inspection, and support of our developer clients. We also provide timely reviews and approvals with customer known service standards and turnaround times that are met or exceeded with each application. Bylaws are, a way, are created as a way to address issues and concerns of the community. They are created to protect the environment, private and public property, and to ensure public health, and to maintain an orderly, orderly appearance in the city. Staff follow the requirements of council approved bylaws every day in order to achieve the desired outcomes. Three bylaws used by infrastructure development to issue approvals and permits are the drainage bylaw, the water and sewage bylaw, and the street excavation bylaw. We've had the drainage and stormwater submission standards effectively in place since 2008. The requirements were formalized by Council through a new drainage bylaw that was adopted in May 2016. Like many municipalities, there needed to be an urban standard in place to plan for and manage drainage effects. Quite simply, new homes and neighborhoods should not be flooding. Without formalized drainage standards, oftentimes municipal dollars were being spent to correct developments rather than focusing monies on new investments. Trying to correct or retrofit an issue after a development is complete is more costly and more challenging than planning and implement, implementing proper design measures at the beginning of a project. Key, key examples of areas the city had to invest in post-development included Westgate and the C Street areas. The Water and Sewer Bylaw regulates the operation of the city's water and sewer system and outlines requirements and responsibilities for all stakeholders. Relative to development, this bylaw regulates service connections such as sizes, locations, control of this water system, and required inspections. Basically, connections to the city's water and sewer system must have approval and all connections inspected to ensure current and future customers are protected. During a review of the permit application, items such as upper floor pressures, fire flows, and capacity capacity demands are considered to ensure the property will have adequate servicing and the city can provide the required demands. The city must also ensure our infrastructure can support development and not strain our existing infrastructure, thereby causing us to invest in deficient, poorly planned areas rather than support new in initiatives. The street excavation by Street excavation permits are required any time a developer is wishing to break or dig into a city, the surface of a city street, which includes sidewalks, streets, curbs, and ditches. This bylaw regulates all cuts and connections into the street right away. Basically, all work within the street must have approval and all work is inspected by the city to ensure current and future customers are protected. During a review of the permit application, Items such as schedules of work, location of the work, size of the cut are all reviewed and considered. Additional consideration is given to minimize impacts into the street and to preserve the integrity of the existing street and infrastructure. Unfortunately, sometimes cuts need to be made into new asphalt. In coordinated efforts with developers and contractors, 
Infrastructure development is proactively and constantly working with transportation environment and St. John Water, the public utilities, and the developers to coordinate all work and minimize the disruptions to the streets. <coughs> A collaborative and coordinated approach to development is key, not only internally, but most importantly with the development community as well. As part of this approach, infrastructure development ensures all requirements are met for sound and sustainable development. We support developers with their projects through to completion. We protect developer investments by having these sound approvals. We safeguard existing municipal infrastructure to protect our investment and future development opportunities. We mitigate drainage effects on both public and private properties, and we align future development and capital capital related projects. All of our work has a ripple effect. Things can go wrong if it's not a shared, collaborative, planned approach. These can include flooding, infrastructure failures, cuts in new asphalt, and no water pressure on the upper floors. All of these items affect developers, the city, and most importantly, the citizens who purchase and occupy these sites. Together with proper planning, and design, we can avoid these costly and unnecessary mistakes. So what triggers the requirements for infrastructure submissions? Addressed as part of the conceptual stage of the planning approvals, the triggers for submissions, drawings, studies, and sketches are identified early on with the applicants under the subdivision bylaw and the building bylaw. Together, these bylaws support development and promote our sound community standards. Depending on the type of de development proposed, the submission requirements will vary. Keeping in mind, each project site and each project are unique. Typically, projects can be classified into four general categories. Large-scale development, which can include residential, commercial, or an industrial project. Developments on new lots. Small residential infill and additions. And all other additions, which include modifications to an existing developed lot. As mentioned on the previous slide, depending on the type of project, the level of detail required will vary. For instance, what's re what is required on a large-scale commercial development would never be imposed on a single-family home. As well, where information is already known in an area, it would not be required to be resubmitted. Key communication with staff at the beginning of the project through the planning approvals process can identify for the applicant the level of submission details that will be required. Listed on this slide are a few different examples of varying levels of submissions that are required. Similar to other municipalities, information we require to be submitted is quite standard. This next slide illustrates an example of a master drainage plan with the inset of a grading plan in the bottom left corner. This is a submission standard representative of a large scale development. This next slide in contrast to the previous, that was very detailed and very expensive to produce for, de to, for developers, is a simple hand-drawn sketch that is accepted for small and minor projects. Quite literally, they can hand-draw it. There's no major CAD work or drawing or any great expense. If they have paper and pen, they can produce this. By way of an example of working through a large-scale development project, I've outlined the process for a complete submission requirement or large-scale, multi-home residential development. In cases where the city takes on the operation and maintenance investment of new streets and pipes, it is critical that work meets standards and has the lifespan intended for the development and future growth. Something I'd like to note on this slide is the timeline for completion. It's 24 months. This timeline only starts once the pipes and streets are completed and turned over to the city. At a minimum, street only has to be constructed to gravel, thereby giving the developer two years from that point to finish the street work while being able to sell their lots. To ensure the work is finished, the developer will then provide to the city a security for the remaining value of the surface work. Once the work is completed, the security is fully returned to the developer. If requested by the developer, a phased release of the security can be returned after major milestones of the remaining work is finished and inspected. Security deposits. 
These are required to ensure work and written statements are completed in full by the developers. They are fully refundable. They are required to minimize the street right-of-way disturbances and lessen the size and amount of cuts in the asphalt. The security calculations are based on current industry pricing that we receive on other projects provided and tendered by the city. The return of the security is authorized for return to the applicant as soon as the work is complete and inspected by the city. In large-scale developments, as previously said, there is a phased release of held security to free up monies as soon as possible. Through the one-stop development shop commitment to improve, can, to improve our services, the following development-related improvements have already enhanced our service delivery for the development community. The city's water model. For approximately the last six years, the investment made by St. John Water to have a fully functioning water model has significantly reduced the level of effort by developers with respect to engineered water submissions. Developers are only required to provide us their service needs and we confirm through the model both domestic and fire pressures and demand availability. This is a huge cost savings onto developers for their engineered submissions with respect to water requirements. The city sewer model. There is an ongoing commitment by St. John Water to complete the sewer model to support developers by reducing their level of effort with respect to wastewater submission studies. Very soon, the city will only be asking developers to provide site servicing flow information, and St. John Water will model the downstream analysis and effects on our existing systems and be able to confirm servicing capacities. This essentially will be a reduction in the level of effort with respect to the engineered studies currently required by developers and also a huge cost savings per project in some cases which would result in a savings to developers in the tens of thousands of dollars per project. Improved developer communication, we, more, we are more actively communicating and reaching out to developers and the development community and trying to get them involved early on in the process. The city presents to home builder meetings, special interest groups, sets up at local building supply stores, and provides a great deal more online resources and tools for our developer community. Pre-application meetings, they started about a year ago, very successful based on the feedback received from our clients. They are typically suited for the medium to large scale development proposals that have or offer unique, challenging, complex issues. The relevant service areas from building, planning, and infrastructure meet with the applicant's team early on in the process, understand their requirements, their timelines, and walk them and guide them through the approval processes. The benefit is to help applicants make better informed decisions up front and get advice early on in order for them to proceed with their projects. Another and new initiative that we launched last year was the Project Champion Role. This service was designed for new customers and projects requiring significant coordination with city approvals. The benefit was to facilitate development approval process, have a designated main point of contact at the city for the developer, ensure the project is moving forward with the developer. Again, based on the feedback we've received from the developers, this service is very successful. Parallel processing, three service areas of planning, infrastructure and building inspection reviews applications at one time. Previously, we would review one department at a time, causing unnecessary delays. Now, more streamlined, efficient, and a much more timely process for the development community. Permit issuance timelines. Customers know our timelines and can better manage their projects. Project types, different project types have different review timelines to ensure that the simpler projects get a quicker turnaround and approval. And customer satisfaction survey. Every permit issued has a link to a survey asking for the customer's feedback, always looking for improvements on how we can make our, our uh, processes better. This slide uh, is an example of our building permit turnaround times from 2017. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to point out is important on this slide. All three service areas, building, planning and infrastructure, review all building permits. 
The 2017 results show that we're exceeding the set published target timelines. This is a direct result of improved processes, commitment of staff to meet the outcomes, and improved submissions received from the applicants. What is very important to note and highlight here is that 2017 was one of our busiest years on record for applications and permits, and we were still able to exceed target timelines for issuing permits. Having said all that information, with all the improvements made today, there's always room to keep improving. On this screen, you'll see a development manual. We're currently working on outlining service area requirements from planning, building inspection, and infrastructure to line, at, line up and map out for the developers our processes, our bylaws, uh, timelines, and the steps of how to get a development approval. We're going to be working on clearer submission requirements with respect to water, sewer, and traffic. In most instances, the city and the consultants defer to the recognized Atlantic or national standards. These documents can tend to be very cumbersome and hard to navigate their way through, so we could do better by having summary submission checklists that reference these documents for better and improved submission requirements. Early development applications initiate a pre-approval from planning and infrastructure while the building drawings are still being finalized. Oftentimes, the building drawings are the more cumbersome part and take longer to produce of the three service area um, in the application process. So planning and infrastructure could be reviewing the first part while the building drawings are still being designed. Uh, assuming no changes, when they submit their building components, the planning and infrastructure approval will already be finished, and then the building drawings could go through the system much quicker. Complete submissions. Raise the bar on submission standards to re reduce unnecessary back and forth time with the applicants. This would expedite the process, reduce delays, and be more timely and cost effective. Better submissions will be, will obviously, have better turnaround times and ensure better use of staff time with new applicants and projects. Expedited return of security deposit. Return of deposit on a credit card versus a check issued from the city. This can be anywhere from 68 week delay from the completion of work. This improvement is being rolled out today and is seen as a major change in process that we will be able to return the deposits back onto the credit card if that is how they initially place the deposit. Um, this will be a big advancement that applicants will get their money back much, much quicker rather than waiting up to two months to get that deposit return. And finally, continued communication with the development community through updates, surveys, bulletins, continued presentations to continue hearing and sharing feedback with them. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions? Councilor Armstrong? How many subdivisions are under construction right now? Any? Pardon me? How many subdivisions under construction? Any? Um, there's one that is, um, will be starting their phase two out in East St. John and their phase three drawings, by, by starting, I mean the plans are in and they're getting ready to do construction this, this season and they, they already have their phase three in. Uh, for approval to to be ready to do their next phase. So has the ground broke on phase one? It's uh, yes, it's and we done? have lots built. Okay. When they give the drawings, how come they have to go back three or four times? Can we not alleviate? That's a huge problem with these guys, as you just brought it up. Mm -hmm. It costs a fortune. Mm -hmm. They submit the drawings. You guys give them back and say this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, okay? It's a huge cost to anybody, whether you're a house owner or whether you're a developer, it doesn't matter. Can we not alleviate that problem? Because you guys are the experts, supposedly, that know what has to be entailed in a drawing. I know nothing. So I come to you and I say this, this, and this. You give me the drawing back and say, no, this is wrong, this is wrong, go do it again. But then you miss something. Can we not alleviate to make it a one-step process of every, so they don't have to come back twice, three times with drawings? Can we not tell them and be uh, user-friendly to say, this is what you need. Instead of going back, come back, oh, there's something else wrong. You send it back in, it costs me more money if I'm building a house or whatever. 
Is there not something to be used, more user friendly to right off the bat say, this is what you need. <coughs> this is what I approve. Yes. Um, right now with the pre-application meetings, it's, it's most times it's the, the applicant is the developer. They're not necessarily bringing in their entire design team. That would be a, a benefit that we could communicate to say, bring your engineer, engineering team in to, so that they're hearing. Um, sometimes the message isn't being passed to the designers so that they know what all the requirements are necessary. So when the drawings come in and they're marked up and they're sent back to their team, some, sometimes, in some instances the message isn't being passed to the actual people doing the drawings. Um, the comments that are provided um, when they're resubmitted, they haven't always taken the advice and the direction that staff has put on the markups. Again, um, in some instances, when there is a lot of that back and forth, um, the city, through better communication that we have, we're, we're contacting the, the consultants and the developers saying, there's a problem here, everybody better come in because I'm seeing that and, and our team, there's too much of this back and forth unnecessarily. What are you not understanding with what we're providing on to these drawings? And so that is, is um, a big improvement in on, on the last slide. Um, complete submissions and clearer submission requirements. That will, I believe, go a long way in clarifying so that they can have it spelled right out. This is what we're looking for and if you're not sure, um, please contact us, please follow these, these checklists, if you will, so that there shouldn't be any gray area in what they're submitting because we are providing that feedback, but I think probably we could do a better job in, in providing that, and if they're not sure, they should be contacting us and not, not um, just guessing on those drawings. And in some cases, it is it is a guess because they they seem to just want to get it in to get it in in the in the permit. Well, time is money. I understand that. Yeah. They have to be done right. But I'm yes. saying if there's a miscommunication between staff and them, mm -hmm. maybe you should right off the hop bring your team in. Yes. We're not talking, you know, I mean, these are major developers yes. that are, are communicating to me. Yes. These guys aren't just one house builders. Yes. These are the developers of the city that are saying, i got to send the drawings back three and four times. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's always two sides to every story, yeah. obviously. Yeah. But if we sit down, it, it, I mean, one house I understand. But if, a, if it's a developer that you guys know, let's get it straight from the beginning. So he has no wiggle room to blame city staff. Say, listen, bring your design team in and let it go. Sorry, Amy. Sorry, sorry yeah. Councillor. I mean, often, you know, we have those discussions and that's where the pre-application meeting is very beneficial. Um, but still, even after those efforts, often we're getting incomplete submissions. And so it does result in this back and forth. So we send it back, it comes back still incomplete. And we educate and talk to them and, you know. So we're, we're always working through that. And, but incomplete submissions is definitely... A, uh, something that delays the approvals and through some of these improvements I think is going to help that. But in, in, yeah, so I think on what the councillors can, I mean I've, I've loved it, I'll make some comments in a minute, but uh, I mean I think I really see it, you know Holly, you've got it up on the screen here, so complete submissions, uh, commitment for continued enhancement to communication, like how do we, because you know that is not only to, to Councillor Armstrong's point, that's not only difficult for the developer and and we we all know it creates a lot of frustration and so on but it's also difficult for for our teams as well right so um uh, anything that we can do to to pick up on is it a i, I don't know the end like is it a, you've got a checklist and and very crystal clear communication i mean i have an example that jacqueline helped me with from last week as well and i won't get specific about but I mean, a absolutely, um, uh, folks were not doing their job, but the city is getting all the blame for it. And these were professionals helping on the file who were charging a lot of money, so no wonder there's a lot of frustration by the client. Um, so it's, uh, but I think, you know, Councillor Councilor Armstrong, I've lived it, that complete submissions and the continued communication, I really see it as a, it's, it's you're almost never done. Like how do you how do we continue to commit to that? And with what we've been trying, if it isn't working, to Councillor Armstrong's point, okay, let's try something a bit different. Maybe we have to be even more direct. Is it a checklist? Is it a is it a very crystal clear communication? We can't move your file forward. Your file is on your desk because 
these elements are not are not yet met, right? So and yeah, else? Just one, one more, yep. couple more things. Do you have any relationship with these develop not the one house people, but I'm talking developers. Is there any it's all about relationships in business. Truly it is. Whether you're in, whether you're in government or even in politics, it's all about relationships. Do we have a good relationship with developers? I mean, we have most of them in the room here, March 14th. Is there a good relationship, do you think, between staff and developers, or can it be improved? Do you have a one-on-one? -on -one? Like, I can pick up the phone and call Councillor McKenzie and have a nice conversation. Are we able to do that? Because I'm hearing one side of the story, which I don't want to hear. I want to hear both sides of the story. Sure. Um, I, I believe our, our relationships are getting much better. What I, I feel there's a big improvement is I believe they have, to, they have to be involved right out of the gate. Don't just send their team in. I think they should be at the table with us, and I'm hearing right from the developers that that is a benefit. They have to be right here. If they're the property owner and they're pushing this ahead, Sometimes they, depending on the developer, they just want to send their team in. They have other interests they're trying to take care of. And what I've noticed is they have to be here present because they're hearing one version of what's going on at our pre-op meetings or our project champion meetings. And when they're right here at the table with us hearing what needs to be done with their team, I, I've heard many instances of how positive experience, right from the developer back to us, to our team, that it's a good experience, they want to be involved, they want to be copied on all the correspondence so that they're keeping an eye on their investment as well because they too are being being um, heard. They're hearing two different stories of how their project is proceeding. And we certainly, I think I can speak from the three service areas here today, that we want them included. If they're, if they're not able to come to every meeting, they're certainly copied on correspondence, they're copied on the emails so that they can see how their project is or isn't progressing. So I would think certainly there's been improvements over the years and it is getting better and and that's based on direct feedback uh, I'll speak from from the infrastructure side Amy and Jacqueline may wish to speak further but from the infrastructure I'm definitely hearing that there's there's been improvements okay two more seconds then because I know we got a, we're short on time I think we should have a meeting personally I think we should bring in the developers again great with you guys so we can get get it out on the table I don't care. You know what? It's about relationships. They're calling counselors. We get one side of the story. Put them all in the room. And you'll find out where the story is on both sides. Because it puts everybody it puts everybody in the middle. But you guys, I want to protect staff as much as anybody. But when you're hearing it from one end, but when they're all in the room together, that's the time to figure it out. So thank you for the Okay, time. thank you, Councilman McKenzie. Thank you, Thank you for the presentation. Uh, you know, it's very well done. Uh, I guess, from my perspective, it's not what we're doing that I have a problem with. It's what we're not doing that we could be doing. And we're getting there. Okay. But I'll just take a couple of examples. Uh, you mentioned about uh, tearing up a street and then putting it down. We have to make sure it's done right. All the rest of it. <clears throat> I know of a developer that said, look, I will pay you whatever. This is too complicated. It's gonna, you know, I gotta go through engineering groups and all the rest of it. I will pay you whatever. You come in, tear up the street, put the pipes to my property line, and I'll look after it from there. And he was told, no, you can't. We can't do that. You gotta go, you know, get a permit and all this other stuff. And, like we could actually make money if we wanted to take the expertise that we have. And I'm not saying we need to send the crew out to do it, but if we had somebody go out on site and say, yeah, you do this, you do that, that's exactly what I want from the water department or whatever, and make life easy for them, and they can write us a check instead of paying it to somebody that they don't really want to deal with. That's one example, okay? That might be a continuous improvement, uh, I don't know. It really, it's like I know when you go into the one-stop development shop, I'm hearing all kinds of positive stuff, okay, all kinds of positive stuff, but it's so... I don't know, embarrassing almost, when the other day we had somebody come to council with a property. Their property line included part of our road, right? And there it is on the screen for everybody to see. And how they ended up there with that picture up there is beyond me because I would think that right at the get-go we'd say, well, we got a problem here. 
you know, your property includes part of our road, we need to work through this little issue, and, and maybe by working through that issue, there wouldn't have been a larger issue. Um, I'm hearing that projects come to a complete halt, complete stop, if somebody's on vacation because there's nobody to replace them, or nobody with the authority to, to do what they need to do. If we can address that, Councilor. That, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Anytime. I mean, that, that, um, that is not the case. Um, Polly is here. She's a manager. But we also have other staff person here um, uh, with, with Nick. And uh, we also have, we also draw upon the uh, expertise from Transportation Environment and St. John Water. So at, at no point does, does approval, do approval stop. Uh, we have uh, backup plans upon backup plans for absences or unplanned or otherwise. That's so, good to hear. Yeah. Have we always had that? Yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. So it's yes. never been the case. No. Good no. to hear. As Councillor Armstrong said, there's two sides to everything. Um, this other issue that I'm aware of now, we, we have to hire a consultant when we're doing a project to represent the city at the site. I think you're getting into the next yeah, topic. For, I think oh, the okay. Yeah. Sorry. Do you, you said you take cash, and you, or you take checks and credit cards. Do you take bonds? Um, with for, the type of, for the type of deposits that infrastructure does, we've never been asked that question. They're typically um, smaller type deposits. Um, there are bonds are placed with the city. It, I, we, I have looked into it over the years to see if I was ever asked that question. Could we take a bond? I've never been approached by a developer. The city does do bonding um, in in other parts of our areas with respect to engineering contracts, um, with respect to the development side for the permits out in the right of way. Yeah. Um, never have been asked for bonding for the larger scale submission or large-scale projects that would require a larger development deposit. Um, we have done irrevocable standby letters of credit um, and certified checks. Uh, we do, we do as a city, take bonding, but specifically for street excavation permits, they're, they're generally uh, small scale and the companies have never pursued that with that request with us. They yeah. haven't? No. There's the other side. We will be talking about things like bonding in part two of this conversation. So I know, but I gotta go. <laughs> I'm probably not gonna get all through sure. part of it. Fair enough. But we can sure. we can come back to that question okay. if you'd like though. I guess the just just a comment. We have we have a two part uh, presentation design specifically for a reason. This was about the infrastructure piece, the other will be our contract management. But there's an overlap in terms of the participants. Mm -hmm. Some of the contractors are doing this type of work, and some of them are doing work for the city as well, so it gets a little confusing, so we've tried to separate the two. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank Council, you. Councilor Lowe? Yeah. Um, so, there is somebody to make decisions if somebody's not there. That Absolutely. definitely happens. Yes. I get three or four quick things. Laterals from the center of the road into the property line. Why don't we run it right to the house and charge the, uh, the builder from the property line, why, why don't we do the whole thing like Fredericton? Why don't we uh, run laterals from the center right in as a plus to somebody wants to build a home or a house or something? Fredericton does it, and I've questioned it for years and years and years, and they say they don't have insurance and they can't do that and all that. The uh, the the three third thing is really I agree with Holly, believe it or not. I think that the homeowner. Or, or the person that's paying the shot. Like, I'm reading this tier one, three and a half business days. You're not averaging in all the building permits because I know ones that are three and four months because of problems. And I think that the person that's paying the shot should be involved. And that's what's not happening. And that's going back to, I think, the one that the mayor just brought up that Jacqueline and them are involved in, right? I mean, we're we're counselors. We're in the field more than you people are. We hear all the complaints. You know, they're uh, you know they're anyways a percentage right, percentage wrong. But when you shake it all down, the person that's paying the the cost to hire the people that are building don't know what's going on. And I think it's it's the onus is on you people. 
when you're when you're hearing a lot of shit coming in about things that are wrong, I think you should contact the person that's paying the bill, and you'll have a whole different interpretation. And so will they. They'll have a different interpretation. And just maybe the guy never applied for that thing right, or maybe the guy didn't do nothing, or maybe the you know the the, the historic whatever you're involved in. You know, it wasn't applied for, right? And and the people that are taking the blame are all you people, right? And and I, I see that all the time. I mean, you know, I'm, you see it out here with the... Anyways, I, I just think that you have to involve the person that's actually paying the money to get the project built. I think that you have to seek them out and tell them both sides of the story. And I mean, it, it, and, and, and that's all I do as a counselor. I. I, they come to me and I say I don't know who's right and who's wrong, but you know find out exactly. And then when you then when 99 or 90 percent of the time, it's the guys that are building it that haven't applied for the proper things or aren't aren't being right up front about the the, the person that's paying the bill. That's the person I think that you have to learn to talk to, not to the people that are doing the building. And uh, you know like the the other question I ask is 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 other cities, we'll use Moncton for an example, is there, uh, are, are they, uh, how should I put it without getting in trouble, are they more lenient? I, if it's a decision to be made and can go that way and go this way, and it's not against the code, I'm, I'm not asking for anything that's against the code or wrong, is other cities possibly leaning towards the easy way of not breaking the code than, than St. John is, right, like you mean? You know, like people tell us, it's it's it's. Well, you, you can tell that, like Moncton's alive, like you know, big time, and you read in the paper all the time. And and I think that we're going to change, and we're going to get alive too, right? Like you mean. But I wonder sometimes if they're more lenient on on the builders than we are in St. John. Are, are we too tough in St. John? I'll give you a prime example. I think it's referring to what John was saying about that diagram of the land that was the city thing. But at council the other night, we changed where that driveway was going. We, we changed. We asked questions, and all of a sudden the driveway could be there. But, but that should have been done at your level, in, in my opinion. If you people had been uh, nicer, easier, more friendlier, why would it have to come to council to get the driveway to go there? Why wouldn't it be done when, when those people were in talking to you, right? I mean, that's, that's why I asked the question, right? Like, I guess the bottom line with me is I, I think things are moving great. I think that you have to talk to the person that's paying the bill more than what you do now. And I think if you do, a lot of problems will work their way out because then the truth will be told what's going on. Okay, thank you. A couple of comments. Thank you. Do you want to yeah, address just a, yep. just a few things. Um, just around the turnaround times, um, our turnaround times, we're tracking um, our turnaround time based on a complete application. So if somebody comes in, they're building a new house, and they forgot to give us structural drawings. We inform them right away um, through, through email or their preferred method of communication. And their, their application gets put on hold with respect to turnaround times. As soon as it comes back in, They've attached, then the turnaround time to start again. So that when you hear three months or something, it's because we're waiting for them to complete their application. Just, I just want to, to clarify that. Um, and then with respect to uh, the code, or are we, are we, are other places more lenient <coughs> than us on the code? I, I assume, Councilor, when you talk about the code, you're talking about the National Building Code. I mean, you know, Holly could speak to best practice in Moncton with respect to infrastructure things, but, you know, um, we are in constant communication and we network regularly with other code officials in the province and we are, um, we are all doing it pretty much the same. Uh, I would say with the exception would be very small, um, unincorporated areas where they may not have the expertise to interpret the code, they may rely more upon the engineers who are stamping the drawings, um, but for our counterparts, we are in line with the way we interpret. And in some cases, I would say that we're, we're really quite flexible and reasonable because of the types of buildings that we have here. We have existing buildings, uh, old buildings. Uh, when people come in to renovate them, they can't meet the exact 
letter of the code because just the type of building that it is and that it's 100 years old. So, you know, we're always working with those folks to make sure that they get their building as close as they can possibly get it to code. And Holly, I don't know if you have any comments about um, infrastructure, like are we in line with We are else? in line. Um, quite often there's there's communication with, with the, the neighboring cities to, because when these things are raised, um, obviously you're hearing it from the development community in, in one, one sense. I too hear comments where they'll say, how come in this project we have to do it this way? And they'll say, Moncton or Fredericton does it that way. I take those comments um, sincerely and I'll ask those questions. Why in Fredericton would you do it this way? And they're like, we don't do it that way. We're using the same national Atlantic recognized standards. We each have our municipal specs. Um, sometimes there's a product difference even that a developer may wish to use that we don't use here. We give them opportunities to say, submit why you'd like to use that. We'll investigate it. We'll see what the pros and cons, and, what, if, and if it's successful, we'll, we'll try it or we'll sample it. So um, different cities have different environments. We have a lot of rock here. We have a lot of changing topography. So some of our requirements might be a little different. But for all intents, um, some of the challenges and that or the comments being made. The other cities are hearing them too, and in, in some senses, the developers and contractors working in those cities are the same ones here. So it's the same story in every city, and we, we as municipalities are trying to equally address these same issues. And I like that the developers give that feedback as they take it and say, well, this is why it won't work here. And if, if I'm at all thinking that there's flexibility, I'll call the others and say, did you ever change this or how did you improve? Maybe we could piggyback on what you've done if you've done all the legwork and research. So certainly I don't think we're out of line with what the other municipalities are doing. And to be honest, quite often they call here looking for how we're doing things because they're hearing complaints up there. Well, St. John doesn't make us do that. So there's... Okay, thank you very much. Just a couple of comments for me and then we'll move on. Thank you. Great presentation today. I'm just sitting here thinking about <coughs> to what degree I'm going to get myself in trouble. Um, so I'm going to go for it here, I think. Um, so first off, we have to grow. It's not, it's not, we have to grow. Um, I'd like us, we must deliver defined excellent customer service. I, you know, what does customer service mean? I mean, I think it can be, it, unless we define it, and we've gone a long way to defining it around targets and building permit turnarounds and so on and so forth. If we don't define it, then it's always going to be up to interpretation, right? So I think we have to deliver great customer service and we have to get better all the time and I think that's what I've seen here again today. I think the city needs to take its responsibilities and I haven't seen anything that, that says the city isn't. But there's a real resistance here uh, in some circles to, to contractors and others taking their responsibilities. Uh, they just want to pick the phone up and call and uh, not submit plans. I mean, there has been a developer of a small infill project referenced here today. I drove up to that site. I mean, that is the resistance to provide even the most basic engineering as required, the same that any other city would ask for, is, is part of our, our DNA problem in this city. Um, and so contractors also have to live up to their responsibilities. I think, uh, you know, some folks have referenced here, the data is the data. So our timelines on tier one, two, and three, uh, um, uh, building permit turnarounds, I would argue, are, are industry leading. And I've worked all over Atlantic Canada. Um, we would wait for even the most basic uh, permit for a home. We would wait three and four weeks in some, in some communities. Um, and I, so I have lots of experience there. I think we need to continue to clarify both parties' responsibilities and push back hard on it. I, again, I see it time and again, every day. I see, I see people will call or they'll stop me and they'll say, your city is this or that. And I think to Councillor, I think it was Armstrong, what, what the developers or customers say. It depends on who you ask. You know, I've had a meeting with one of the lead developers in all of Canada, certainly in Atlantic Canada, who sat with Jeff and I in a meeting and said, before we start, I want to tell you you're the best municipality in the, you know, in the region and one of the best in the country to work in. But yet, <laughs> in the same breath, we could be stopped and say, you guys are ridiculous, you ask for too much. So it's, it's you know, let's then clarify the responsibilities. If we haven't, 
I know we have, sorry. Let's continue to clarify those responsibilities. We must protect the taxpayer. This, the taxpayers in this city have paid tens of millions of dollars fixing other people's work that they didn't want to fix or didn't do right in the first place. And, and um, I, I just think we have to keep that in mind. I think what we're asking for, I think uh, Jerry just asked this, Councillor Lowe, what we're asking for in my experience is, is, is the exact same thing that other communities all across the region ask for. But, but, but there's an undercurrent in St. John, and with due respect, we've got some very good developers here, but there's an undercurrent of folks that don't want to follow basic rules. And I, again, I repeat myself that I think taxpayers in this city have paid tens of millions of dollars fixing issues. Um, so then we have basic rules in place for, for good reasons. Um, and then I guess the last thing, and again, your last slide here, Holly, is right on the money. Um, uh, you know, my past life, I was in the home building business, and the minute that someone would give us a check, the clock would start, and that house was going to be ready in eight weeks. And four weeks after they gave us the deposit, we still had no countertop colors, no cabinet colors, no siding colors. We couldn't build the home, but we were late. We were late. So I use that as an example to, to again, really clarify. I hear you saying, you know, Amy, that you, you, you know, you note in the file that the file stopped, but, but maybe there's some other opportunities here to really clarify um, and, and with the revamping of a website, maybe there's some technology tools down the road here where they can get an automatic email every day that says, we're still waiting, we're still waiting, we're still waiting, you know. Yeah, okay. And um, so, so again, I guess your, your last slide, I think, is right on the money. I won't reference the specific file, but, you know, there was one that, that Councillor Lowe and I with, with Jacqueline, with, with staff's help last week, where the customer is very frustrated, and uh, my, my view is that, that, that um, their expert team has let them down immensely, but we're wearing it all. And, and uh, so we need to continue to work at that. I, don't, I, think, I have not once seen anybody here say when we're responsible that we're not responsible and we're going to do something about it. But somehow I'll wear, we should wear ours but we should, we should work to clarify who's got the file and who's doing what, because I think that is a real bone of, of contention. I'm not disagreeing with what my colleagues have said today, but, but what are we going to do about it? I think you're all over it in this last slide, so that would be my comments. Can I just say one more thing? Sure. On, on your comments, and I agree with what the mayor is saying, but I want it known, because the pressure is here. In the city, the image is, with the people with the money, right or wrong, and I'm, they have a negative feeling about this city. And they're the guys with the money. And the people with the money hold the power. Whether you like them, hate them, or it doesn't make any difference. They are the ones that the movers and shakers that hold the dollar bills. One guy coming from out of town might be here once. The people that live here that have the money have the image that we're hard to get along with. We have to straighten that out in two growth committee meetings, or last one. Jeff has brought up whatever you want, a PR thing, and I agree 1,000%. we got to get on board to tell the good story that's happening with staff in St. John. Both sides, both stories have to be out there. And unfortunately, we're always behind the eight ball. So I just want to make it clear, and thank you, Mayor, for the time. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Just, I guess, to follow up to the councillor's comments, I think, I think it's a really important point, and I, I guess I fear sometimes that we're, um, we're a product of some, some older history, too. There's been a tremendous amount of work done in the, in the growth of community development around the streamlining of one-stop development shop. It doesn't go back very far. I'm talking three, four years of re-engineering the way we can take in the, the milling permit uh, you know, the intake and how we streamline that through our process, the key performance indicators that we're tracking, the complete re-engineering of the process, the rewriting of bylaws to uh, respond to today's needs. Uh, there's been a lot of work done that might not be reflected on somebody who might have made an application five or six or ten years ago. And, uh, and I think it just needs to be recognized. That's not to say that there isn't room for improvement. 
there's lots of room for improvement, there's room for dialogue, and there will continue to be room for improvement. Uh, but there's been a lot of progress, too. And so I wanted to make sure at this stage that you know, the, the committee is hearing where we are. Okay? And that's not to say we aren't going to go any further. But, you know, this, is, this is another side of the story, I guess. Okay, thank you. Just, just piggyback on, on Blake. Like, when he says the rich people, the, the, the people are the ones we met with. They have all the equipment to put the holes in the ground. They have the money. And and they believe, as a group, and, and it goes to what Jeff says, that, that they believe that you people are too hard to get along with. And and, and it, it, it's the idea that that's not really true, but they have other things to do other than build homes, right? And we want them to build homes. We want them to, they, got, they own all kinds of land. And they, they can do the foundations. They get all the equipment sitting in their backyard. They're the ones that we want them to develop. And I, I would really suggest that somehow, Jeff, that you have these people meet with them and, and we try to massage out. Because I, I, I don't think it's true on either side. I mean, I'm even more friendly to you people today. But I mean, it, it's that these guys can build homes. I mean, I can name two or three of them build homes. I had them sold before they were finished. And then they get into the attitude, ah, it's, it's too hard to do it. I'll go to the sand pit and lug gravel out of my sand pit, or I'll, you know, I'll go and work for somebody else with my big equipment, right? I want them to build homes because they can do it. And when they did it, they sold them off. There's only one, one of these outfits that Blake's talking about that hasn't sold their homes. I only think because they, they haven't really pushed to sell it. But I would love to see Jeff somehow massage uh, things with you people and we get them. And I think that's what Blake's talking about. I sure wish Thank you. Okay, thanks. And um, I know we I know we need to move on. One one of the things, just to, to make reference to to Steve here, um, and, and the work that Develop SJ. I mean, that's part of um, um, part of the work of Develop SJ and its board is to look at where we are and look at where the opportunities are. You know, uh, Mr. Carson, right? And 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 make sure that. Um, uh, that the offering that we have moving forward is complete. That we're building the types of homes people want. So it's, uh, you know, these these are complex. Look, like it's not. I don't. I don't want. So to uh, I th again, I'm not disagreeing with the comments made. I don't want to leave the the media with the impression today that it's uh, something that the city is owned and is 100% responsible for. Um, and and with some of the market conditions we have, and that's why it's so important that this committee. Is working on 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 growth with our three pillars: people, jobs, and growing the tax base. The work that Develop SJ is doing, uh, making sure that we're connecting with our our, uh, our potential developers and also attracting Mr. Carson new developers uh, to St. John that that specialize perhaps in ways that some of our folks locally don't. So, okay, with that, let's have a receive and file. Okay, one more. No, no, no. Oh, go ahead. Receive all one. No, no, it's all one. We have to hear the other report. Uh, is it? Okay, sorry. Okay, did you have another comment? Yeah, I just wanted to, to tee up this one. I think Brian okay. needs to plug into Jack there and uh, get his presentation going. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is a two-part presentation deliberately. Uh, this next piece really, you know, by rights, is not uh, pure growth uh, subject matter, but the overlap is considerable. So we just had the discussion around infrastructure development and subdivision development. So the point is well taken. There's a community out there that needs to be encouraged to do development and we need to have uh, our system streamlined in a way that encourages that. But a lot of those same folks, I think Councillor Lowe put it well, you know, they, they have other lines of business, one of which is uh, doing contract work uh, for the city. And so, you know, part of our our brand, part of our image around doing, doing business in the city is also doing business with the city. And so we have a number of those contractors who would be competing for and winning business. So we wanted to also talk a little bit about how we do our own design, tendering, and, and contract management. And, uh, and then we'll address some questions there as well. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Keenan, I think, unless Mike, do you want to say anything? No, nope. I think Brian's all teed up now. Okay. Nice stuff. So Your Worship and uh, members of the Growth Committee is here today to uh, provide a presentation on the capital program design, tendering, and construction management. So the Municipal Engineering Team is a group of uh, highly professional, dedicated individuals 
work diligently in a cost-effective manner, the best interest of the city, and the taxpayers, and the ratepayers. So the team consists of uh, myself as the engineering manager, uh, four professional municipal engineers, and technology support staff. The uh, engineering team provides uh, engineering services, both uh, St. John Water and Transportation and Environment Services for sanitary water, storm, and, uh, and the transportation system. And each professional engineer will manage, uh, on average, about eight projects annually. And the team meets bi-weekly to review uh, progress on the uh, project design, tendering, and construction with the goal to discuss and remove any uh, barriers progress and discuss uh, project specifics to ensure consistency in uh, decision making. So in addition to the design and tendering and construction management, the following additional functions are completed by the uh, internal municipal engineering team. So asset management, uh, investigate problems with the city's water, sanitary, storm, and transportation systems and to develop solutions, fair cost estimates for projects, capital program planning, budget analysis, reporting, uh, respond to uh, requests from citizens, organize and attend public information sessions, uh, coordinate with provincial and federal governments on various initiatives including funding programs, updating the uh, city's general specifications, preparation of requests for proposals for engineering services including evaluations of the proposals, uh, project management with consultants, and uh, program scheduling using Microsoft Project, preparation of council reports, coordination, direction, and support staff, field survey work, uh, preparation record drawings, and updating the GIS system for asset management. So a typical annual capital program uh, for 2018, for example, we have uh, 21 projects in the water and sewer utility program, the value of six and a half million. On the general fund side, we have uh, 11 projects, storm and transportation, for an equal value of six and a half million. So the uh, annual capital program planning is an ongoing process. It starts with a condition assessment of assets. And the primary condition assessment mechanism for sewerage systems is the uh, internal CCTV uh, video inspection program. And for the transportation systems, it's the uh, micropaver and paver condition <coughs> index uh, program. And based on the condition assessments, uh, projects are prioritized and uh, Utility fund and general fund and recommended projects are coordinated to ensure they are completed efficiently. So what's a typical timeline for a, say a $500,000 project? So we have a, a design engagement uh, request for proposal. It would be six, take six weeks uh, to uh, advertise the, uh, the RFP and to receive uh, proposals, evaluate the proposals, uh, give a report to council and then sign an agreement. Site survey and field investigation, two weeks. Uh, <coughs> design period, will 10 weeks. Uh, project approval, this will be a minimum of two weeks. Tendering award, six weeks. Construction period, 10 weeks. And reinstatement, two weeks. So, so uh, overall, like 38 weeks or nine and a half months, so that's pretty pretty significant uh, timeline to uh, bring a project to from start to finish. So the pro project timeline can vary depending on project approval requirements. <coughs> Uh, certificate approval to construct is required for some of the more significant projects as well as, say, a wastewater lift station. Uh, and that approval will come from the province. An environmental impact assessment for some of the major projects that we're doing two uh, uh, expansions of uh, wastewater treatment plants this year, Mortar and Greenwood. And uh, those both had to undergo an environmental impact assessment with the, with the province. And as a matter of fact, that one probably took about a year, so it could be pretty significant. Wetland and water course alteration permits. Whenever you're working near a, a wetland or water course, uh, you have to obtain those permits from the, uh, the province. And the final one would be property acquisition, which uh, involves uh, private uh, property owners. And sometimes uh, they have their discretion if they want to uh, provide the uh, property. So that can be uh, private consumer as well. So I just want to compare. Uh, St. John timeline with that of, uh, of Fredericton. Um, in St. John, we uh, well, that last year, in the end of 2017, we approved the 2018 capital program in October. Um, first, uh, first bracket there, the planning four weeks, so that'd be allowed time to develop the uh, request for proposals. 
And then the uh, design engagement uh, RFP process uh, explained earlier was six weeks. Survey and field investigations is two weeks. The design period was ten weeks. And then the approvals and then of two weeks. So that would take you from uh, capital program approval in October to when you could advertise tenders would be the first of April. So that's our that's our timeline, and it's really hinged on when the capital programs are approved. And you step back a year or two when uh, capital programs were, were uh, approved in December. All that does is just extend the uh, tender advertisement date to uh, to June. So um, so Frederick has a shorter. Uh, Shorter timeline, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one is they don't uh, they don't go with public RFPs for for design engagement. They just do uh, direct engagements. And the other uh, advantage they have is they they uh, have a uh, a line item in their capital programs for design investigations. Or sorry, engineering investigations and design. It allows them to uh, the, uh, the engineering component or whatever is not directly tied to the project. They can vote and secure uh, uh, engineering services at any time. So they can go right to the planning stage and without going out for call for proposals for engineers, external engineers, and we just have a survey of two weeks, a design period of 10 weeks, approval uh, duration of two weeks, and they're ready to tender, advertise tenders in February. So St. John and Frederick have similar size capital programs, around 13 million going forward for 2018. St. John model, we have uh, 32 approved projects, budget of uh, 15 million, with 2.6 million overall for the uh, estimated engineering fee. Uh, 23 of the 32 projects, budget of 5.3 million, will be designed by internal resources, and that would have an equivalent engineering fee of $800,000. Nine of the 32 projects, uh, budget of 7.7 .7 million, will be designed by external consultants. and. Equivalent fee there would be 1.8 million. So the Fredericton model, they do the majority, almost exclusively, they're, they're designed by using external consultants. So it would equate to about 2.6 million in engineering fees. So the advantages of the St. John model, um, the annual wages, including benefits for the internal design group, is about 750,000. So that savings that we, we have from uh, not going out to external consultants of 800,000 is, uh, is an offset for that. Uh, the external consultant wages are about 2.5 times the internal wages. Internal staff is available to uh, perform work tasks, and I described those uh, previously with what some of the other additional tasks were that you do those year round with external service acquisition. You've only got to be engaged from the time that uh, the term of the project. So an advantage to having the uh, work done by the internal design group. St. John, St. John model uses a combination of uh, internal staff and external consultants for design work because it's more cost effective overall. The only disadvantage is that there is not sufficient internal resources to complete all the project designs concurrently. So overall, the design period for each team would be over 26 weeks, which would require spreading the project tenders, advertising those over several months. <coughs> we, looked, we looked at the timeline earlier with Fredericton and they uh, they can hire uh, consultants for each individual project and they can run those designs all concurrently where as if you want to try to uh, streamline and save some costs on design and what happens is you have to spread the tenders out over a little bit longer period. The so staff has tabulated the uh, tendered amounts uh, month by month for 2017 and early 2018. <coughs> we haven't noticed any significant uh, increases in the tender amounts versus the engineer's estimates by extending the tendering into uh, April and May. So for 2017, for example, um, we ran at about an average of about 90 percent of the, uh, the tender value would be about 90 percent of the uh, engineer's estimate. And for 2018, uh, right up to the uh, you know, second week in uh, April, we've, uh, we're running at about 80 percent of the engineer's estimate. That's the tender value. So we're getting good competition and uh, good tender results even into April and May. So the, uh, so the tender schedule, so in 2017 we had uh, 18 projects tendered and three of them uh, were held up. Uh, the first one, Warner Greenwood, was held up due to the environmental assessment that I spoke about earlier. That's now uh, advertised and actually closes, uh, closes today, so looking forward to some good results there. And then two other projects, the MRG Forest Main and the Hanover Street Storm Sewer. Uh, those projects are uh, 
held up for, uh, for property acquisitions. So for 2018, uh, what we do is we, we tender the uh, major projects first, so the ones that have the more significant uh, timeline for, for construction. So projects like Linster Street, City's Asphalt uh, Resourcing, the Curb and Sidewalk Program, our major program. The project's been awarded. Vizard Street, that's been awarded. And then the, the Musquash uh, Pumpy Station, the electrical substation, uh, it's closed on the 1st of May also. And then the three, uh, three remaining excavation style projects, uh, Westgate Park, uh, Glen Road, and Rockland Road, are going to close here in uh, the next couple of weeks. They're all advertised, we just got to close in the next week or so. So the next uh, slide shows what are referred to as uh, specialty projects. These, uh, <coughs> these projects uh, are normally uh, bid on by the traditional excavation contractors. The first two, uh, sewer lining and water main cleaning and lining, they're um, a very short duration uh, at each site for the, for the work to be completed. Uh, next to uh, Ocean Drive, the carpenter place, uh, inside facilities so it would be a good, uh, good opportunity for some fall work for the contractors. And then the last one is uh, crack sealing. Um, if it's best done in the fall, we get the best, uh, get the best uh, outcome when the cracks are sealed in the fall. So as you can see, the, uh, the majority of the tenders uh, you know, are going to be advertised in, you know, by, the, by the end of May and expected to result from the, uh, from the tenders. So the construction management, uh, the engineer is responsible for the uh, design and the overall constructive systems. So the, uh, the engineer is responsible for placing their uh, engineering seal on the uh, final design drawings. And they also have a professional obligation to, uh, to ensure that uh, you know, not only the design meets the standards, but that the uh, final construction uh, system uh, functions as the design intended. And also for the uh, Paramount into the safety of the, of the public. The City of St. John has a set of uh, construction inspection guidelines for the uh, inspectors to follow. Um, the inspector must familiarize himself with this, these guidelines in addition to any uh, bylaws and regulations, permits, and the uh, design drawings and specifications. The authority of the engineer. Um, the engineer has the authority to define the meanings of the contract drawings and the, and the, and the specification. And the uh, contractor must adhere to all the decisions, uh, directions, and instructions from the engineer. Measurement of the work, uh, the engineer's representative and the contractor's representative at the end of each month will uh, measure the uh, quantities of the field, and the uh, contractor will present those to the uh, to the engineer for verification of the uh, measurement and include a fully itemized list of, uh, of the uh, estimated value of the work for executed up to that, for that month. So, um, what are the mechanisms to uh, manage dispute resolution? So, um, if a contractor is dissatisfied with any of the engineer's decisions, uh, they can request the matter be referred to uh, arbitration. And we've tendered in the last uh, 25 years, we've tendered for over 500 contracts, and there's only been one, one uh, payment dispute that went to arbitration that was a number of years ago. So, that's a pretty good track record, and uh, it's extremely rare that the uh, engineer and the contractor uh, do not resolve matters to the normal day-to-day uh, -day, uh, process. The uh, design and construction specifications, the first two are uh, approved and adopted by Common Council, the general specifications and the storm drainage design criteria manual. Uh, the next two are the Atlantic Canada guidelines for water and wastewater, uh, the Canada-wide strategy for management of municipal wastewater effluent, Transportation Association of Canada, Geometric Design for Canadian Roads, uh, the National Building Code of Canada, and the Canadian Electrical Code. The most uh, well-used document, the most popular, is the uh, general specification. The purpose is to uh, provide the uh, contractors with uh, requirements for bidding and working on uh, City of St. John construction projects. We do uh, annual updates, and there's a stakeholder uh, engagement process that go along with that. So the uh, stakeholders are encouraged to uh, provide comments and suggestions to assist in enhancing the general specifications and there's actually a letter on the website that uh, to that effect. Um, 
once the, uh, the, the draft and the specification revisions are compiled, they're sent out to the St. John Construction Association for uh, distribution and comment. Um, the various contractors, and that's followed by a request to uh, attend an annual meeting at uh, Rossi Avenue to uh, discuss uh, comments they may have on the draft specifications, and uh, also to discuss any uh, construction administration matters that the contractors uh, may wish to want to raise. So that's uh, important uh, to get together once a year to uh, talk about the uh, general specification updates and also to discuss anything that's going on in the construction sites that we wish, we wish to uh, provide feedback on. The examples of some of the uh, suggestions that have been adopted that came from the stakeholders, uh, staggered tender closings, Tuesdays and Wednesdays when multiple tenders are closing in a given week. Implement a mandatory requirement for the uh, New Brunswick Construction Safety Association certification of the uh, contractor's uh, safety program. Um, one of the more important uh, ones that was adopted for the paving contractors was to introduce a liquid asphalt price adjustment clause for changes in the index from uh, the time of tendering to the placement of asphalt. So what that would do is we'd, we'd lock in the uh, price of the liquid asphalt at the time the tender close. And when the asphalt goes down, if, it, if the uh, through the Ontario <coughs> Producers Association, if the index, the time the asphalt goes down, if the index is higher, the contractors uh, compensate it accordingly. If, if the index is down, then the city gets a, a credit, so it's a win-win situation. Uh, the next cycle of the uh, proposed general specifications is going to be released in the coming week to the uh, St. John Construction Association for review and comment. That will be followed by a request to the uh, contractors to, extend, to attend this annual meeting and uh, at that time, a forecast of any remaining upcoming tender advertising will be provided. So, you often hear about uh, construction risk on the uh, to the contractors. Some of the things that the city does to uh, to uh, reduce the risk is uh, utilize unit price tender forms and as opposed to lump sum. So, the contractor installs you know 100 meters of an eight inch pipe they get paid for 100 meters they install 105 meters well they get paid for the 105 so um, they can submit claims for extra work for evaluation for any unforeseen work um, liquid actual adjustment clause i spoke about earlier and the city obtains any environmental permits in advance of the tendering so the contractors will know prior to the bidding what the, what the conditions are for the, for the environmental permits so process uh, improvements going forward, uh, the, uh, for specific projects, uh, the application of uh, engineering consultants uh, based on availability, experience, and performance, just to help to reduce the overall timeline. Um, Frederick and Mall of including a separate line item in the future capital program budget for engineering investigations and design to allow design work to proceed earlier. It's not directly be directly linked to any particular project, and then it can continue year round as a uh, uh, and provide advance notification of upcoming annual construction tenders to the uh, St. John Construction Association. So, so with that, if you worship, uh, just open up for any questions or comments. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dean. Um, sure. Well, I, I, you may have run over this before, and I'm sorry if you have, but... Uh, thank um, you for coming, Shirley, out of the sick bed to get here. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, like, um, when you're hiring these consulting engineers, like say I'm the consulting engineer, that would kill you, wouldn't it? <laughs> and we're doing a, a job, like, you know, maybe a water and sewer job or something, and the consulting engineer has a certain opinion on what you should be doing that you might not have expected to have to do. So then, what happens if the consulting engineer and our own engineers do not agree. I mean, do you talk this out, or do you just overrule the consulting engineer and go ahead and do whatever you plan to do? Yes, so. And I guess the reason I'm asking that is that, you know, I understand that that might sometimes happen, and so then I think, well, why are we hiring consulting engineers if we are not going to take their advice? Thank you. So, so. The, uh, the way the process uh, should work is that if the, uh, if the city engineer that's uh, overseeing the uh, project are named in the, in the contract, if there's a consultant involved, then 
but what should happen is the, if, if there's a difference of opinion, the, you know, the city engineer should go talk to the consultant one-on-one -on -one and have a discussion and uh, you know, come to agreement on, on, on what should be done. And then that information should be passed from the consultant on to the contractor. But it shouldn't be a you know, three-way discussion and, and a difference of opinion in, in kind of that open forum. Like if, it would be a rare, to me it would be a rare occasion that the, that the city engineer would have to step in and, and provide any clarification. Like normally the, uh, the consultants that they hire are, are very seasoned and they, they know the city's uh, uh, policies and procedures and should be able to make the uh, proper decision on, on the sites. But um, ultimately um, when it comes to the taxpayer's money that the, uh, you know, the city might have to intervene occasionally just to, just to clarify uh, an item. but. Uh, I would hope that in most cases the, uh, <coughs> you know, the, the consultant would make that decision in the field. Okay. And just, uh, I might as well, just one little more thing. Um, I want to know, do we have a policy, like, you know, I can name a couple streets that, because originally they had a sidewalk on each side of the road, you know, originally, and then when we let the contract, we seemed to do the same as we've had before. And uh, someone told me there was a policy the city had, the council must have passed the policy that, you know, when you completely redo a street, if it originally had a sidewalk on both sides, then you do it again on both sides. And I just think that if we have a policy like that, that should be looked at. But when you look around the city, you know, sometimes we have two sidewalks on a street that Maybe there's one person a week who walks on the sidewalk. You know, it's not used, and it's a, you know, a fair amount of money. I mean, if you go over to Rope Walk World and North End, and see the nice big sidewalk there, beautiful sidewalk. Go down to Exmo Street. I remember when we did that project and had a terrible time there on the big hill. And nice big sidewalk there. I mean, you know, I'm just bringing that up. I wasn't here for the first part of it, but that, sometimes that bothers me because we have two sidewalks and we don't really need two sidewalks. <coughs> so do we have a policy and that's why you have the two sidewalks? <coughs> so there's no, uh, there's no uh, defined policy for that. It's just sometimes it's difficult if the, uh, you know, the homeowners have, you know, obviously there's houses both sides of the street and, and they each had a sidewalk previously and then when you come in to do a reconstruct and you want to take away one of the sidewalks, like you know which side are you going to take? Like who's going to be who's going to lose their sidewalk? It's it's uh, sometimes difficult. So, but there's no policy. It's uh, each is a, each is ca it's case on its own. And uh, one thing we do try to do is when we when we replace sidewalks now, we try to put a, like a grass median in and try to try to uh, the grass median. Sometimes they, uh, a brick uh, brick median strip just to try to beautify the area. But as far as sidewalks go, like. Uh, do realize that you know there's the ongoing maintenance associated with it too. So, so we uh, you know we don't we don't want to spend any any money that we don't have to. But sometimes it's hard to take away something that the homeowners well, have. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Okay, I just because uh, some of our new subdivisions we don't have two sidewalks; they only have one. Only yeah. needs one. Yeah. So, so if it was a, a subdivision like uh, you know. Downtown's the uptown's a little bit more difficult, but if it was a subdivision like a, a traditional sub subdivision with the houses set back further, we would only have one sidewalk, one side. But sometimes in the uh, like in the uptown area, it's more difficult to take away a sidewalk that they, they previously had. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Lowe. Hey, Brian, like there's a lot of stuff there, and but I, I want to talk about pavement, and I see. I see where you got the crack ceiling stuff, right? I, I think the new, I think the pavement in the city is a disgrace. And and I'll give you, I'm not talking potholes by no means because you guys are out filling as fast as you can. I see them every day. Crown Street between Union and Leinster was, was, was milled two years ago and paved. You got yourself now six to eight inches in the middle where the seal is. You drive anywhere in any city street today that was milled and paved two years, three years ago, it's completely open and up. There's something wrong. And, and you're running around, I, I'm pretty sure that's what that crack ceiling is, to put in the middle where they, where they meet. That and uh, any other 
cracks that may permeate up uh, up through like in, not just near necessarily the center line but any yeah. cracks. I'm o I'm only going to talk about the center lines. Right. Not talking about potholes because I think that I think you guys are doing a great job. I go over, I drive around on one today, go over it the next day, and it's filled. Like, you know what I mean? I'm talking where new pavement's going down, and I'm talking on the main line, right. where she's just opening up, more than I've ever seen before. There, there's something wrong, or there's some kind of, and I mentioned it to Mike and Jeff the other day in the elevator. I mean, and I'll give you that example of Crown Street. Right. We don't have the water trucks on that no more. Those trucks from Sussex aren't running it no more. And I, I could see... If the double water trucks coming from Sussex were pounding that road, because that's how they ruined the lower end of Crown Street, turning in to where the potash is being delivered. But you got normal traffic there now, and it's it's opened at least eight inches, two years, and 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 the one that was done last year <coughs> is opening up now too, and and that's I I just don't understand why and why we can't get some system to to. To pave it, I know it's easier to pave the highway because you know you're going straight ahead. But the streets in the city that are being paved in the last two, three, and, and you know I'm not blaming the person that paved it, but there's something wrong why they're opening up to six and eight inches and, and getting wider every winter. So let's get a comment. So is that is that a quality standard? Is that the standard in the first place? The spec line and then quality control. And can you make a couple of comments? On and and and. and I know you have a gentleman, I met him before, the guy that does asphalt down there, he's probably an engineer too, right? The gentleman on the right hand side when you go down the court, I forget his name, but I mean, I, yeah, right, exactly. I spoke to him about paving places before. I, I'm just saying that, and, and you're getting blamed for it. I mean, the city's getting blamed for this because, you know, like, it, it's you get a brand new street paved, everybody's happy, and then two years' time, you can drive down the middle with a different car in the hole that's already there. And I say, I'm definitely not complaining about potholes. I'm complaining about streets that are just paved. So, so I don't believe that it uh, has to do with the specification. I think that the specification is, is sad. I think it's a, it's a lack of uh, materials and workmanship that we're going to have to uh, take a closer look at. So you know, we're just, uh, just starting to mill a few streets there now for the upcoming uh, Asphalt resurfacing program, so we're definitely going to uh, focus more on, uh, you know, on getting a good joint between the two uh, two mats. So, so I'll take your comments, uh, you know, very seriously, and we're definitely going to uh, to go forward to make it, to make sure that it doesn't happen uh, in the future. So, Brian, but if it happens, so let's just let's just expand, maybe. So, so what protection does the city have? How long are the bonds in place? How long is the warranty? And what happens if something? <laughs> does go bad, do we just uh, say don't worry about it to the contractor or do we hold them responsible? Can I just jump one thing to I agree everything you're saying, Your Worship. Do you agree with me, Brian? Have you looked at the, uh, you know, I'm not asking, I'm telling you after the fact, but have you complaints before where these new paved jobs are opening up in the middle? Uh, I, I agree with what you're saying. Okay, this, good. This seems to be with uh, the last, uh, last couple of seasons and we do, uh, we do have a, a one-year uh, warranty period and a one-year bond, so we can. There are a, a number of streets that I have to get the exact streets that we're going to ask the contractor to go back and address. Uh, so I, I jotted down uh, Crown Street, so we'll take a quick look. Crown between at that. Union and Union and, and, and Leinster. Yeah, yeah, we'll take a closer look at that one. Good. And, uh, Thanks. That's. Yeah, so many guests just on the council's point, so Mr. Reynolds? I, I guess I would just add to this point that um, what's happening, what we're doing in terms of specifying our asphalt and all the QA, QC that would go around uh, placing that asphalt is, is following national best practices and in line with what every other community would be doing. So we, we certainly were aware that there were some issues uh, during one phase of the uh, asphalt resurfacing project that had some particular issues which we, we've addressed. Some of the streets that people may be noticing may be related to that and we'll be following that closely but uh, I, I can assure you that what we're doing in this community is, is definitely what every other place is too uh, so you know we're going to continue to keep an eye on it and there may be some streets that we'll, we're able to follow up on in the warranty. So just, just following up on that, Commissioner, uh, 
I don't want to ask something I'm not supposed to ask, but I mean, have there been examples in the past where you have, we have had quality issues where you've, you've held the, we've held the, the supplier responsible to redo the street to, to, to live up to their bond? Probably the last uh, two or three years, I'd say that we probably had uh, eight streets where we asked them to go back and redo, so we do all of them uh, compatible for that. So we have uh, a follow-up program. We'll go back and review the streets after, you know, prior to the one year uh, warranty, and uh, there's any deficiencies, and we'll hold the contractor accountable and have them, have them redone. Okay, thank you. Sir? Okay. Uh, yep, Councilor Armstrong. Okay, there's a lot in this report. A lot, a lot for me to decipher. Um, Brian, in the uh, 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 where do I start? Okay, the city doesn't have a revenue problem; we have a spending problem. So when we got together here on March 14th, it was uh, both. What? I would argue we have both. But well, if you're in business, you first look at your revenue, and then you look at your cost. So I'm looking at the cost. We have an engineering department out there. But you say you have four engineers, four technicians, da da da, and we're doing 13 million with their capital projects, right? Okay. Fredericton's doing 23 million, so that must be a typo there. Well, I, think, uh, I think it was they're doing 13 million also, and it's uh, the engineering fee associated with that would be 2.6 million. Yeah, but Fredericton's doing 23 million and more to come. It's on the website. They're doing 23 million with the capital work plus, but it, it, it's here nor there. But there's a type of it doesn't matter. So, so actually, what I did there is the uh, projects like uh, that don't require design, like street resurfacing, those kinds of projects. I, I didn't include those in that in that equation. I was only after the projects that would require uh, detailed design to make that comparison. So I, I didn't include jobs like uh, curving or asphalt resurfacing and those kinds of projects. So what's our total capital budget? I thought we approved it. Yeah, well, it's uh, October 2nd. Wasn't it 13 million dollars? It would be 6.5 million, like on the one and then 6.5 for the other, right? Yeah. That's total 13 million, isn't it? Right. That's right. My math is right, isn't it? But I, I was just saying with the city of Fredericton, uh, when you went on the website and you, you added all those projects together, like uh, some of them would not involve design. They're just So I didn't include those ones in the, in the equation. They, the ones that require design in the city of Fredericton, they'd have about the same over 13 million dollar annual capital program that requires design work. Okay, so you relate that out. They have two engineers on staff. We have four, and I'm just repeating that I know nothing about engineering, I know nothing about nothing, okay? But I'm asking you to ask the question. Sure. Each engineer, industry standard, should look after 10 million worth of work. That's right across the board, that's industry standard. 10 million. So we should be doing, with four engineers, we should be doing 40 million worth of work. See, see the. Uh the big difference between St. John and Fredericton is part of the presentation, but uh, I'm not, I can't uh, confirm that they have only two engineers. I, I don't know. I never asked that question, but they, they exclusively will hire uh, consultants, so they don't do any internal design on their own, whereas our engineer, our four engineers, uh, are doing uh, internal design projects. So if you went out to the marketplace to, uh, to, to get that work done externally, the work that they're doing internally would cost you, uh, it would cost the city eight, eight, eight hundred thousand dollars to uh, get that done in the external market. So the wages and the, and the uh, like the markup for uh, for benefits and whatnot, it's uh, it's, it's, it's a, really a wash. Like the uh, we pay the, the engineering design group pay them about seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, and the work that they do, if you went out to an external market, it would cost eight hundred thousand dollars. So if I I may follow up as well. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'd agree with that, that benchmark. Um, I think it depends somewhat on the complexity of the projects, but also the scope of them. For example, one engineer may be able to manage one $10 million project in a year, but if that were that same engineer were to try to manage 20 half a million dollar projects, there would be a problem. They're not, they're not equivalent even small projects have a, a certain amount of built-in effort, so you know it, it's hard to draw those comparisons. If we have a number of projects, it, it's you know, there's only 
there's a limited capacity to manage those. So with with the way it breaks down here, if every engineer is is uh, has a workload of about eight projects in every in a given year to uh, design, tender, um, do the contract administration for that's that's a considerable amount of workload it, in this business and in other businesses that I've been involved in with design and construction. It's the, you, you, you quit, I don't know if we're doing apples or apples or apples and oranges here because obviously we have a building out there we have to pay for. There's more staff than four engineers in there. How many people do we employ in the whole engineering department? How much does it cost the city? There's nothing in here. And I'm not asking you to answer any of these questions today, okay? It's just questions that I have myself that probably can't be answered today. And I don't expect it to, but I mean... No, I think we have answered the questions. Yeah. The fact that what Brian is saying is that if you take our cost for our engineering staff, it's $750,000. Mm -hmm. If you went out and hired that on the street for the equivalent amount of work they're doing, it's $800,000. And we have the benefit of the staff being there. One of the challenges that Brian laid out was when you're doing this, this work in house with your own people, you have to do it sequentially. You can't do them all. You can't do your design work all at the same time and do your tendering all at the same time because you can't farm it out to four or five different firms at the same time. So there is a bit of a lag in terms of the timeline getting the design work, but we get a benefit of having additional work done by those folks at the time when they're not doing design. So it's a I, mean, I, I think the point that I had heard in the previous discussion was, you know, Fredericton and other communities are leaner, they don't have the number of people, they're handling the same volume or more with fewer people, but when you boil it down and analyze the actual costs, it's not as clear as saying, well, that's a better model than the one we have. Brian has also laid out that there's a way to accelerate our timeline, and that's by looking at direct award on some of the design work rather than doing an RFP for that work. And that would require a couple of major changes. First is we'd have to set aside money specifically in the budget for that purpose without earmarking exactly what the, the project would be. So you need an envelope of dollars, exactly what the practice is in Frederick. Second major change would be we would be awarding that work without a competitive process. So obviously there's some risk to that in terms of ensuring that you get the best value for public funds. But it would, it would involve, and it's strictly speaking, it's well within the legislation to procure professional services without competition. It can be done. Uh, it's not in contravention of the Procurement Act. But you have to weigh that against best value. If by direct awarding and not competing are you getting the best, the best price on your design work, and what's the trade-off? You're getting a little longer timeline before you get to tender, but maybe you're getting the best value on your engineering services. And really where that becomes you know, really important is do we think we're getting good value by tendering two or three or four months later than another jurisdiction? And right now the evidence would say we're getting about the same value. We feel we're getting relative to our own estimates excellent value this year. But that's the... <laughs> We can put anything down, but we don't absolutely know. We're getting one side of the story. We're not hearing from anybody. We're hearing from your side, right? Which, is, But I'm saying I'd like to hear the exact cost of what it costs to run our whole engineering department that runs a $13 million capital budget. What's your number, Brian? Well, there's, there's four, four municipal engineers and myself and, uh, and the, the four design technologists. And like I said in the... In the uh, Presentation that's, well, I don't include myself there because I don't, I don't do, I'm more in the administrative area. I don't do the design myself. I have four engineers that do it. So the value of, of that is about $750,000. And like, uh, like the city manager said, uh, there's about, uh, if you went out to uh, with the projects that they, they take on, if you went out to external consultants and wanted them to do that design work, it would cost you $800,000. So <laughs> the their, you know, their salaries are being offset by the by the work that they're doing and, and, and the design work they're doing and putting out the tender. So, so there's only four engineers in the whole city. There's four. There's four engineers as part of this municipal engineering design group that, that do the design, tendering, and uh, project management, and they, they all report to me. I think what the councilor is getting at there's there's this confusion. Around 
the engineers doing design work and we're doing both. professional we're consult engineers. We're, we're farming up consultants and we have engineers. We're doing both. No, but you asked a question mm -hmm. around how many engineers do we have? We only have four is the we answer. We have four doing design work. And we have others who are in different roles. Yes, we have engineers all over the world. engineers all around this table. That's what I'm at. Didn't I just ask the question? How many engineers are employed by the city of St. John? That's my question. Am I allowed to have an answer? You're an engineer. Well, I don't know the answer to that. We see. That's what I'm saying. I'm trying to get to the basic cost, Jeff, of what it costs for us to run an engineering okay, so, department. And so all time, time out for a second here, folks. So, so, um, um, so, I, so we've had a presentation. I mean, the purpose of the mm -hmm. presentation. We're going to go into a closed meeting here next. Uh, the purpose of the presentation today was to walk through the process that we followed and try to get at some of the the questions that we answered. I think we're you know we're starting to go. I'm not saying you can't ask the question. Counselor, but the right spot for the question. We're starting to get into to very specific HR components, and I'm not I'm not sure that that's on scope for this piece of the discussion. Um, and if there's specific HR questions that that you have, we can probably we can get them for you. We can. No, but, it's uh, cost. Yeah. It's cost. Yeah. So if this is in the open. This was brought in the open. I'm asking the questions. How much does it cost? That's yeah. a, that's a pretty basic. As an elected official. To ask yeah. how much does it cost to operate that building out there on Ross Avenue besides his Brian? I'm sure it costs money. What's the dollar value? Is that not a right, right. of the council to ask that open question in open council or open growth? It's yeah. an actual cost. Yep, yeah, same manager. Yeah, through your worship, I think uh, the councilor's question is going beyond the scope of what we intended to present today. The focus of the conversation today is on engineering services. So that we can do an apples to apples comparison with other jurisdictions and with the data that he's asked about. Uh, if you're asking a more general question, how many engineers by education or by profession are employed by the city of St. John, that's a that's another exploration that we have to get Okay, into. then we'll move I, on. I, for example, have a diploma, a de degree in engineering. I would not consider myself part of Brian's team doing design work. There are others around the table here who would have that training, but are not are not engineers uh, in terms of design work. So that that's a different question. If you if you wanted an in depth analysis around the cost to operate the city and each of the departments, we'll refer you to the budget business. Okay. So Brian, you say that you, you hire these consultants, correct? Right. And now we're bringing out, we, we approved the budget October 2nd. I know you say they should have had a line item. Why weren't we told October 2nd when we approved the budget, the earliest in the history of St. John, so we could get this work done and out to tender? Because when you put the jobs out, it's just basic mathematics. When there's no work, this is when you get your best prices. And when there's no work, it's January, February, March. So if we, did, if we approved it in October 2nd, now we're just finding out Right? That there should have been a line item in there that we could have helped you to get to move that process faster so we can get better prices. So, so that, uh, as part of the presentation, what I did when, when uh, I knew there were certain questions being asked, I did some research and did some comparisons. So that's when I mm -hmm. talked to the city of Fredericton about how their process worked and how they were able to get the work out sooner than <coughs> on. And, and that's when I found out that they carry a, they have more flexibility for that. So they, to carry that line item in the capital programs to allow them to uh, engage uh, for design services really at any time during the year. And plus, they, as uh, the city manager explained earlier too, they, they don't have the requirement for uh, going out with a public call for proposals for all their engineering services. They can do uh, direct engagements. But as far as the, the capital budget getting approved in October, like I don't think anybody was specifically asked about, about when, how soon the tenders would follow. Like. Uh, I thought, personally, I thought that, uh, that we had a, a really good year as far as uh, tender releases go. Like we did these some, you know, some in uh, earlier on in the season, and uh, uh, within the next couple of weeks, we're going to be done releasing all the excavation tenders. So I, I thought that we were, we were doing pretty good. We are getting good results. Like in 2017, I explained that we were getting the value was about uh, the tenders that were closing was about 90% of the uh, engineer's estimate. And then in, in 2018, um, the average of the tenders that have closed so far this year 
it's uh, about 80 percent of the engineer's estimate so we're getting excellent value there's all kinds of good competition and uh, one of the recent tenders that we just let had seven bidders they're hungry no but that, work. And, and you know what to the to to your department both of you we save 1.2 million to get on the asphalt from the asphalt tender do you know why we saved the 1.2 million because we had another guy in the bidding and now you have two more bidders bidding because that one guy started an asphalt plant, which is beneficial to this city because we have more bidders. Last year, we're getting three and four bidders, a million dollar jobs. So I'm saying, the quicker we get the process started, as I thought, we, when we pass the budget, there has to be help for you. And if that's a line item, well, we can change that. But we did not, we weren't aware because the, the contractors would like to do jobs that are off road. You can bring out the tender for that if you're designing it, you bring it off-road. If it's a, like I call off-road jobs instead of the streets, you put in your report, I understand why you don't. But now we're bringing out jobs in June, by the time it's done, right? They got, they got June, July, August, when the weather's really good to start paving, and, the pa and not the big paving, come to back to the paving. It's a cake mix is what I'm told. We do the specifications, not, is that true for the asphalt? Yeah, we, right? we have detailed technical specifications. So what I'm told, and I'm just a repeater, because I'm not an asphalt guy, but I've talked to guys that worked for the city 30 years ago. The cake mix is not right for the city of St. John. I don't know. I'm just repeating. And they say, you know what the biggest thing is? And I remember this as a child. When they went in to roll the pavement, they rolled it all day. Now they roll it for two hours, and they're done. And they want, he says, and I'm just repeating the guy that did it for 25 years, city, he said, they don't roll it anymore. This is why your pavement's breaking up. I go, gee, that kind of makes sense. I don't know if it's right or true, but there's just a little information for you. <coughs> That's a guy on the ground that did it for his livelihood who worked for the city of St. John on the asphalt crews. I know I'm off tangent, but it's just a little info. Check that out, please. Number one, the cake mix isn't right for the city. And number two is, how about them rolling longer because it's private contractors doing it, and what do they want to do? When they make money, they get in, they get out. But that doesn't mean, and the roads are breaking up, there's got to be some truth to it, just as Council of Lowe brought up. Why are we paving, and then all of a sudden, two years later, they got their year contract, or their, you know, um, warranty in, and then after that, it's, it's on our dime. So maybe we can look at that. So anyway, I, if you have something to say, then I'll, I'll make well, another just motion. Just finish up quick, please. Yeah. Yeah. So you're... Well, I'm done, but I want, I want to make a motion that we table this to the next meeting, because I have some questions I'd like to get answered, please. Yeah, and if I have a second for that, I'll... Second. Yeah. yeah, so to bring it back for another discussion? Is that what yes, yeah, next group okay. committee. No problem. Yeah, so I have a couple of comments. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I guess I can't uh, make my comments then. Um, okay, so... I no, but it's a tabling motion, so. Okay, so um, a tabling motion then for all those in favor? Aye. I'm contrary minded. Maybe Barbara will ask me a couple of questions after we're done. Okay. Thank you. I'm contrary minded? No? Thanks. Motion carried. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think that is the end. Thank you very much, uh, Brian and Michael, for the presentation. I think that's the closing of our open meeting. Thank you very much.